Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host, John DeLynn. Today, we have a really fascinating and compelling story for you. We're going to be answering the question, what happens when you jump on the Mormon train, um, get married, have kids, and your spouse dies? Mm. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the grief of that. We're also going to be talking about the Mormon Church's uh, temple sealing policies and how they differ for men than women, and what that means for you, in this case, as a Mormon woman <clears throat> who's trying to date again as a uh, widow Mormon woman, and what how that impacts your dating opportunities and what your dating experiences are. There's also going to be faith journey stuff here, and uh, just a really compelling um, Mormon story. Joining me in studio as my partner in Truth and Righteousness is Margie. Hey, Margie. Hey. Thanks for joining us. Yes, my pleasure. And our guest for today is uh, a woman who, I don't know who, who knows Janae or not, but it's Janae Thompson. And I met Janae at a Stephen Hassan uh, Thrive event last week. And she uh, has a really cool story, but just as uh, a side of interest, she owns and runs a apparently very popular YouTube channel called The King of Random, or T-K-O-R. It has like 12 million subscribers at this point. But that's just kind of a, a fun little thing to note <laughs> about Janae. Just a little, a little <laughs> side. But Janae Thompson, welcome to Warmer Stories Podcast. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Well, we're excited to have you. Uh, anything you. you want to correct about the introduction? No, I think you got it. Um, the YouTube channel is a fun side note in our family, and... You know, other than that, we're a regular family and we do the day to day stuff. And I have four kids, and life is crazy and amazing. And mm -hmm. it's a science channel. So there's a lot of um, things that my kids like to try to uh, emulate on that channel. So we've had, you know, some explosions and fires that are inappropriate <laughs> for children my age, but or my, my kids' age. But other than that, we're surviving. <laughs> Should we should we mention your late husband? Will people even know his name? Is was he kind of a known? Yeah, person? yeah, he was. Yeah, did, Grant did, Thompson is my uh, late husband, and he uh, he and I created uh, the King of Random about mm, ten plus years ago. Okay. Mm. All right. Well, this is obviously really sensitive stuff, but really important stuff. You came to me and shared with me your story and briefly, and I'm just like, yeah, this is a story we need to tell. Mm -hmm. um, really quickly, would it make sense for you to kind of start with an intention? Obviously, we want believers uh, to watch this. Obviously, your family is going to hear about this, mm -hmm. and there's always kind of like, whoa, you you talked about the church mm -hmm. you know, publicly. That means you must hate it or want to tear it down or take people's faith away or so lots of assumptions. Yeah. What would you like to share about your intentions uh, to start? Yeah. So this is kind of, I mean, this is really near and dear to my heart because this is a story of a journey and, you know, what happens when in life you start asking questions and they're the hard questions and then, you know, do you have the courage to listen to what the answers are and be open to the truth, whether or not it's you know, supporting what you have believed your whole life. And, you know, I've always felt like faith is one of those things that when life tests your faith, it comes through. And if it doesn't, then that's a whole new story. And so my intention is just to kind of just share where I've been and, you know, how I got to this place and where I'm at now, because, you know, it, life is a journey and I'm in this place now. And I love to have the ability to share that and just have understanding with people that, you know, I really love and care about. Yeah. And, and I imagine it's excruciating to have four young kids and to lose a spouse. And so mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there if they're in a similar situation who might feel like they may not make it. I don't know. Yeah. And I think it's a hard thing to ask, you know, death is a really, personal experience and it's different for everybody. And when it happens inside of a family where it's one of those deaths that's unexpected um, and kind of you look at that and you're like, oh my gosh, I hope that never happens to me. I would never have expected that. It's hard to engage with those people in that grief 
space and process and know what to say and how to like relate because it's kind of one of those things where you're like, oh, I just don't know what to do. So I'll create distance. And then that creates isolation. And it's like, you want to connect, but you don't know how. Yeah. Mm, Such a good point. Yeah. Well, thank you for being willing to share your story. Yeah. So let's do it. Let's jump in. Right, Where's your mama it. story begin? Janae Thompson? Well, I guess it begins on the day I was born in <laughs> 1982. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I was born into a really wonderful family. Um, my parents were both uh, born into the church. Uh, my grandparents on my mom's side were also born into the church. My grandparents on my dad's side, one was a convert and, um, immigrant from Denmark. So he was the convert. And then, um, yeah, we, uh, we were very, you know, close as a family growing up. Religion was, you know, the center of our families, the center of our culture. So, you know, I did all the things I was blessed as a baby. Real quick. Where, where did your parents kind of set up shop city wise or? Yes. So they met in Provo. At BYU? At BYU. Okay. And uh, then they set up, they bought their first house in West Valley. My mom's from California. My dad grew up in Provo. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so they set up in West Valley? Yes. That's the first home they bought. Okay. And you're how, you're of how many kids? Uh, so I have four, there's four of us uh -huh. and I'm the oldest of the four. Oh, so you're the oldest. Mm -hmm. So were you born in that West Valley house or? Yes, I was. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. And then, um, and then they kind of upgraded it to a bigger house in a, another part of West Valley. And I was there till I was 12. And then I, uh, we built a house in Harriman. Okay. What well, are you able to share what your dad or mom's professions were? Yes. My, I come from a long line of school teachers. So my mom was a school teacher. Her parents were school teachers. Oh. She does special ed and mm. she's amazingly talented. Um, and she did a lot of ESL. So she worked mm -hmm. with the kids that were learning English and had, you know, special education needs. And then my dad, um, he worked for a corporation for a little while and then he started his own business doing real estate. And mm. so he does that okay. still. So, I mean, there's a heavy education bent to TKOR. So yes. you get that from your mom. Yes. Maybe. And growing so. up there, I mean, as much as it was, we go to church every Sunday, it was these children, you children will get a bachelor's degree. It mm -hmm. was never like a question. And it wasn't, it wasn't this like commanding thing. It was just like, yeah, when you go to college and get your degree, what are you going to do? Or what are you going to study? It was just always, so all four of us have college degrees. I'm the only one that doesn't have a higher degree than a bachelor's. My, all my siblings have master's degrees. And so, yeah, that was definitely like a very important value for my parents. Okay. So how Mormony was your Mormon home when you were under 10, let's just say? Um, it was very Mormony. It was everything. <laughs> I mean, we did the whole thing, you know, we did the scriptures and prayer at night and everybody was complaining and fighting while we we're trying to read. And, um, we did family home evening and, um, you know, we, we definitely went to church every Sunday, non-negotiable. When we went on vacations, we would find a chapel and we would, you know, meet the people there and go to church there. And, um, when we, when I was ending high school, we went on a family church history tour. We went to New York and so we saw Palmyra and we went to Ohio and Kirtland and, you know, all those things. And we were on the road for like a month and it was such a fun trip. And it was so amazing to see all the, you know, places where some of these church history events took place that I had, you know, learned about my whole life. Mm. Okay. So it sounds like a traditional idyllic Mormon mm -hmm. childhood. Yeah. I would say it was idyllic. <laughs> I, I mean, we were happy most of the time. I mean, our family wasn't perfect. You know, my parents yelled at us sometimes still, but, you know, there was never anything where I felt like afraid or, you know, like I just felt really safe growing up and I felt like my community supported us and my parents were really loving and, you know, I generally liked my siblings and, you know, like we got along fairly well. We had our sibling fights, nothing like the way my boys fight now, but, <laughs> you know, um, I only have boys and I, I think that my sister and I were a little less aggressive than my boys and my brothers were not, you know, I mean, they were just a little more lower energy. And so I felt like we, for the most part, got along really well. Mm. And how do you, what do you, how do you reflect on your, the Mormon aspects of your childhood in terms of like church and the hymns and primary and your relationship with heavenly father and Jesus and the scriptures and mm -hmm. 
So my mom always had the calling of the primary chorister and she just loved it. Like she would just get into the songs and she'd make all these beautiful like posters and, and she'd teach it with this, like, uh, you know, just such a, this love that she had for music. And so I remember being in primary, my mom was always the chorister. So she'd always be teaching us the songs and I'd kind of already like watched her go through all the, like, you know, visual aids that she made. And so I, I really liked singing time cause my mom was there and she loved it so much. Um, and I, I really love music. And so that's another part of just, it was a good connection that I had with the music growing up. And it's funny, like going back in my memory, like remembering these times, it's like, yeah, that was really nice. And, and then the rest of it, I remember just feeling like I was kind of checked out, like, this is really boring. I don't know what everybody's talking about. Um, I, I just want to go home. <laughs> so doctrinally and theologically, not so into it as a kid, but as musically, a kid, but musically yes, loved it. Yes. As a kid, I just, I would listen and, you know, I would absorb everything that was being taught to me. It wasn't super important to me. It just was. It, it was the way the world worked. It was the reality. It was the truth about everything. And so I just kind of, it was just there and I just accepted it. Okay. Anything else about your childhood years before we go to adolescence that are important in your story? Mm, no, I think, I mean, it was, I, I finally got a baby sister when I was eight. So I was really excited about that. Oh, your second sister came at eight? Uh, so my, so she's the youngest, I'm the oldest, and there's oh. two brothers in between us. Oh, got it. So got it. I was okay. just really excited to get a sister. Got and it. that was, you know, like amazing because she was born and I was getting baptized. Mm. And it was like this really mm. just fun mm. space to be in, to, you know, be growing up and then get a baby sister. Fun. Mm. I have a quick question about mm. if you happen to remember... Or reflect, if just reflecting now, are there certain messages that you either, you know, showed up in your childhood that drove you forward, either about yourself or the world or families or, you know, mm -hmm. kind of became a plant from which you... Yeah, I think the message that I was really special, um, like that message really drove this uh culture in my mind that I created around, you know, this group that I was a part of, my family and the church, that I was just really special and chosen because I had the truth and, you know, not everybody had that opportunity. And so I just remember feeling like, wow, I don't know why I get this opportunity. And, you know, so many people don't, but I just remember feeling really special and that it was a huge blessing and responsibility and that, um, like in some ways I was more privileged than a lot of the world. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's jump to your adolescence. Let's talk about your Mormon adolescence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was a little bit the black sheep in my family because everybody really, um, was, you know, by the book, uh, you know, with the culture and going to church and everything that was taught. And I, you know, when I hit about 13, I was like, oh, I kind of want to explore the world and, my parents will tell you, you know, I snuck out of the house at night. I, you know, I never did anything that was like bad, but I just wanted to like explore. So I'd sneak out and, you know, go out with my friends and, you know, we just kind of walk around and, um, and then my neighbors would tell my parents that their daughter was sneaking out of the window. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I found out they knew. And, um, I remember one time I wanted to, this is just an adolescent story before I started dating. Um, I wanted to go snowboarding with a boy and I wasn't 16. And, you know, the rule is you no dating till you're 16. They were super, my parents were very strict on that. And they didn't want to even let me go to this dance like two weeks before my birthday. They did end up letting me go, which I was really grateful for. But I'm like, I'm 16. Like, in two weeks. It's the same as two weeks now, two weeks later, but it was a fight to go to this homecoming dance as a 16 year old. And, um, so just prior to that, I wanted to go snowboarding with this friend. He was a boy. Um, and my parents were like, no, that's a date. I'm like, no, we're just friends. Like, I just want to go with this friend. And so, um, you know, I, I was asked to pray about it and, and then whatever answer I got, you know, go with that. And I was like, oh yeah, I prayed about it. God said, yes, it's great. Like, <laughs> I think, I think God's supportive of me, I you know, that. so that was the approach that, you know, like was taken. And I was like, yeah, I'll Your do that. Like, Oops, we, we yeah. And I was like, yeah, I think God would want me to go snow skiing with my friend. <laughs> 
And whether I actually prayed about it or not, I honestly don't remember. I think I probably did. And I was like, yeah, I think it's fine. So they, and they did honor that and they let me go, which I appreciate that um, ability for my parents to say, okay, here's the choice. And I, in my mind, I think they know, you know, you're going to feel like it's not the right thing to do. (laughs) Maybe, maybe not. But when I was like, no, I think it's fine. And they were like, yeah, okay, you can go. Um, I appreciated that. And, you know, I felt like I did have a choice, which was really nice as Mm. a teenager. Okay. So you were adventure, adventurous, mm-hmm. but not, cra- not, not, not too, crazy, not too out there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And how did your testimony develop into your teen years? And, yeah. Yeah. And I, I always ask, sh- sh- shame in the church, you know, bishops interviews and shame mm-hmm. is such a part of so many Mormons people's mm-hmm. story. I, I'm also curious if that entered into your story. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely did. Um, I think during the teenage years, I was, I was, I was kind of removed from it again. I just wasn't super interested in it. It was just the way we did life. And I, I didn't have a strong desire to like look deeply into other than anything other than what I was kind of just taught at church. Um, and I liked it. I always felt good at church. You know, it, it felt like a safe place and it, it was what I knew. So it was our routine. Um, but as far as like doctrinally, I didn't really have any interest in going deep into the doctrine. Um, and then as I, you know, continued to grow up and progress, um, just in my development as a human, uh, and like starting to date and, you know, go out with boys and I I was pretty conservative, um, with the guys, like I didn't, I wasn't super interested in dating, but I'd go out, you know, when I was asked out and I had fun, we liked the group thing a little bit more, but I do remember, um, there was a heavy emphasis on, you know, physical affection as teenagers. And there was a lot in young women's around, you know, do this, don't do this. Uh, this is appropriate. This is not appropriate. Um, and me as a kid, like in my home environment, you know, like those were not things we talked about. And so I was really trying to figure out like, okay, um, you know, here's what I'm learning at school. Here's what I'm learning at church. These are more taboo subjects with, you know, family. So like, how do I navigate this? And, um, you know, I just remember like making out with this guy and then, you know, feeling like super, super guilty and like, you know, I'm going to like, I probably need to talk to my bishop. Like, I'm not sure what to do now. And and I remember like writing about it in my journal, just feeling like so shameful and, you know, and we hadn't done anything, you know, beyond like making out and, you know, just like maybe some heavy, pe- like not pet, but just like, you know, kids making out. And so I was like, Oh, I think I need to talk to my Bishop. And I was just so scared too. Cause I thought I was going to get in trouble. And I remember thinking I was in the church and I was like, well, if the Bishop comes up and asks me how I'm doing and, you know, wants to talk to me, then, you know, I'll, I'll tell him. And so I'm like sitting there in the hall and I'm kind of waiting around for, class to start or whatever. And the bishop comes up to me. He's like, Janae, it's so good to see you. I want to talk to you. Will you come to my office? And I was like, oh my gosh, like, you know, God is like taking me right to what I need because I clearly have to confess this. And so I went in, you know, and I was like, yeah, I, I, I made out with this boy and he, he was just kind of smiling and, you know, and he was, he, he asked for some details and, you know, I gave him some details, which, I I was like, Oh, I don't really want to talk about this, but you know, like I'm going through the whole process and, and he's like, yeah, you're, you're, you're still worthy. And I was like, Oh, okay. Phew. I'm still worthy. (laughs) (laughs) Phew. That was a close one. You know, like, I just remember thinking like, how do I live life and be in this culture and in this church and like not do things that I feel like are kind of like par for the development course? Cause I, cause I felt like I shouldn't be kissing boys. You know, you want to hear that a Bishop gives you that answer that you're worthy, even if you've quote messed up mm-hmm, in according mm-hmm. to the law of chastity, mm-hmm. but there's a, because it'd be worse if you said you're unworthy. Cause right. I mean, and that's a lot of people that we talk to, Yeah. but I'm realizing there's a problem with just him saying that you're worthy Yeah. because it's still him declaring mm-hmm. that he has the right to evaluate. Exactly. 
what your worthiness is before God, that he is, he's allowed to assess it Mm -hmm. and ultimately gets to make that decision. That feels problematic now that I think about it. Yeah. And in that moment, you know, when I, when I had that conversation with him, I felt like, oh, okay, I'm okay. Like I'm not damned, you know, like I'm not going to go to hell. And it's because he said that it's not because I felt like I'm making a lot of good choices in my life. It's not because I felt like Uh, I'm exploring relationships and it's not because I felt like I'm doing really well in these thousands of aspects in my life. It's this one thing that I focused in on. I'm like, I think I did something wrong and therefore I will be damned forever. But then he said, you're okay. But also there was no direction beyond that. It wasn't like, well, don't do it again. Or like, even if it's like, well, you know, that's a natural part of growing up is to want to like explore and kiss a boy and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, I I mean, I walked out of there thinking like, okay, if I just never do it again, then I'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Which that led to a lot of, you know, uncertainty the older I got. Yeah. Yeah. I think also inherent in that question and what goes on oftentimes in Bishop's office is is this idea too of uh, just like you said, like, oh, am I worthy? And it's kind of like we go outside of ourselves to Mm -hmm. get the to have the judgment of like, oh, and he said, I am, so Mm -hmm. I am. Uh, But it starts that kind of pattern Mm -hmm. of looking to someone else to give us what optimally we would want to develop inside ourselves. Yeah. And one of the things I love the most about my life is I feel complete stewardship, if you will, around, you know, my value and my worthiness of you know, being a woman and a mother and, and it just is so empowering now to feel like I can, I make that decision versus yeah. someone outside of me. Totally. I was going to actually do a follow-up. If you were going to think about that time in your life, how would you have talked about where you felt worthy or where your value came from? Do you remember how you yes. felt valuable or how you felt worthy? A hundred percent. I felt valuable and worthy based on what I did. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, if you do good things, you're better. And if you do bad things, you're, you need help. You need, you know, you're not as valuable and you've got to move from that space back into the, you know, valuable space. So it was never like you're worthless now, but it was like, you're not where you could, should be. And you're not reaching your potential. And so that needs to change. So inherently, I feel like, okay, that needs to change, which means I'm not good where I'm at. Yeah. And so if I were going to ask particularly with like within young women's Mm -hmm. and the messages that you got within the young women's program, Mm -hmm. where would you, what were the messages around where you felt valuable and worthy that way? And then I have a question within your family just to see if they're the same or if they were a little bit different. Yeah, I think, um, I I mean, my biggest memory of young women's is I loved being around the girls my age for the most part. Um, And then I remember the, um, what is it, the thing you'd say over and over, what's that called? Young women's theme. The theme, yeah. I I just remember thinking like within that theme, I don't remember the words exactly, and I know it's kind of changed a little bit now, but like we make and keep sacred covenants and, um, you know, like I, I just remember every time I would repeat that, I would be like, what does that really mean? And what am I really getting into? Cause I am saying this over and over and I don't know what it means. And I don't, I, I, I don't even know what that is. So like, I know I have to do this thing, but there's not clarity around what it is. And it sounds really big and important. And what if I don't do it? Mm-hmm. Like, what if I fail at this thing I'm repeating over and over? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And then would you say that your family culture valued similar things to the young women's theme and the messages you were getting at church? Or it sounds like they had an education emphasis and that's an area maybe yeah. of a little bit of difference. Yeah. Um, but where did you feel valuable at home? Uh, definitely in school and academics and church activity. I would say those were the um, the top things that were emphasized as these are the accomplishments and the achievements that we want to put as central. Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> so uh, let's just say for those high school years, any important elements to your Mormon story? You know, I, I guess I do want to hear what 
for those, especially for those who have never been Mormon, kind of what were you taught was the life you were supposed to be living? You know, what were you supposed to work towards as a Mormon woman? What should your goals have been? Mm-hmm. How much did you internalize that? Mm-hmm. And and kind of the, I call it the train, but like the life that the church and that your parents probably wanted you to pursue. Mm-hmm. What 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 did you perceive that um, ideal to be, and how much were you bought into it? Yeah, so I would say I I was bought into it a hundred percent. What was it first? Yeah, as as far as what it was, it was like okay. Um, we go through school, we get good grades, we go to college. Um, my mom was actually a working mom. She worked most of our growing up years as a school teacher and she chose that profession. I, for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons was that she, um, could, you know, be working when we were in school and be home when we were home and have the same days off as us. And, and it was this, um, this culture of, you know, there's a, a huge emphasis on prioritizing motherhood, and for my mom to not lose that priority, she chose a profession that matched with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I kind of thought, well, that's probably what I'll do too, because I want to, you know, I want to be a mom. And I was definitely uh, taught and believed that, you know, over and over again, I kept hearing motherhood is the most important job you will ever have. And no other success can compensate for failure in the home, especially with mothers. And so in my mind, I had these two values being given, you know, one is education and one is motherhood. And so this, this was a challenge as I went to college. Cause I was like, well, I want to be a mom. So do I really need to go to college? And I like to learn. So I want to go to college, but what should I study? Um, and so that affected me in a lot of ways because I didn't have a clear direction on what I wanted to study because at first I wanted to do, um, like a chemistry undergrad and then go to either dental school or med school. Mm. But then I was thinking if I do that, you know, that's 12 to 15 years of school. And if I get married and have a baby, am I going to want to continue to do that? Um, and so, uh, at the time I was doing, um, like a chemistry type thing, but then I changed it to exercise physiology because I was like, well, then if I quit, I can, you know, still be in the physical, uh, you know, therapy type. I could be a personal trainer or physical therapist or something if I didn't go all the way to doctor. Um, And then I got really interested in like psychology and the social sciences and the, and the child development classes. Cause I, you know, I did take it quite a few of those. Cause I was like, well, if I'm going to be a mom, I should take these classes. Uh, Yeah. In high school and college both. Yeah. And, uh, so then I, I, um, decided that, you know, maybe I want to get a social, like have a social background and go to law school. But again, like the same thing was like, well, that's a lot of schooling. So in high school, I think mostly I just focused on doing stuff that I enjoyed and, you know, trying to get good grades. Even though there was an education emphasis in my home, it was not the most important thing to me. I really liked being social and, um, I, I liked engaging in all of the activities and stuff and being in class for the social aspects. And, um, but, but I still, you know, did my work and got good grades and I mean, you know, decent grades, B's and A's and, but it wasn't, high school was not as important to me because education was more one of those things that I was going through until college. Then kind of those values between the education and motherhood really started to set in as I, started living on my own and seeing how the world worked for real, not just in this home where I was always taken care of. And so that's kind of where I got more of a desire within myself to actually educate myself and actually look into like, what is it going to take to become a mother? You know, so like the real life aspects of these things that I'd been taught, but they were definitely seated throughout the whole, you know, duration of my upbringing. So is it fair to say your parents emphasized education, but as you contemplated professions that you might pursue, like medicine or whatever, Mm -hmm. that you felt like, uh, there's going to be a cap there because there's only so much education I could do before I need to get married and have babies. Yep. And so maybe you self-limited what you thought was within the realm of your possibility, education and career-wise? Yeah, a hundred percent. Because I, and I, I came from this background as well, like 
you know, like mom's a stay at home mom mm-hmm. and dad works. And so if I'm mom and I have, you know, a hundred thousand dollars of student debt, is it fair for me to expect dad to go to work and pay for all that when I'm not working? Cause I have a baby, you know, and that's kind of the, and I really wanted to be a mother. Like I really was just looking forward to the day when I would have a baby of my own. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to do these other things. So I, I constantly felt conflicted around that. Yeah. And it wasn't this like you can do both. It's either one or the other. And I'm not I'm not saying that that was the messaging that was given to me like you can't do both, but it was certainly an emphasis on motherhood is the most important thing and education is secondary and in our family education is very important so you'll still get your education and then be a mom. Yeah. And wh- where the rubber meets the road for me as I'm thinking about your story is mm-hmm. the 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 path for a Mormon woman Mm -hmm. is dependent on, number one, finding a husband, Mm -hmm. number two, that the husband's the primary provider, Mm -hmm. and number three, that the husband lives. Yes, correct. Yep, that's all the way through. That's the map. (laughs) You got to follow it. (laughs) And so that's great if you're going to build your whole life around a man that you hope to marry someday. Mm -hmm. Unless something goes wrong with the man that you marry someday. Right. And, and I did build my whole construction around, I, I'm do, I'm going to do everything that I've been taught. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to get a degree. Um, I'm going to get married. I'm going to have kids. My husband's going to be the provider. And we together will build this world, you know, and hopefully like I'll be able to help him with my education, but I, I don't want to be the primary breadwinner ever. I want to be the support. Yeah. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. Okay, so anything else about your high school years, worth, faith, the church? You know, I, I there's a funny story. I was in one of my um, family development classes, and I I copied one of my friend's papers, so I cheated, you know. And my teacher gave me the paper back, and I knew that they were um, – also in the church. They were kind of neighbors, not in our direct ward, but like outside of it. And when she handed me the paper back, she wrote this sentence on the paper and it said, where's your integrity? Cause she was saying, you know, mm-hmm. I know you cheated. And I just like that never, never left me. And I felt horrible that I had cheated. Um, and I felt really embarrassed because, you know, we're in the same church and I cheated and she knows that's wrong. Cause we don't you know, cheat and lie. And that's a religious value. And so I felt super embarrassed, but then, um, it also really stuck with me my whole life as a question that I always had to answer myself, where's your integrity. And so I remember feeling so shameful about it, but then how impactful that question was from a teacher that really like guided my life in so many ways, Mm -hmm. um, around like a simple thing, you know, copying somebody's paper. It's not that big of a deal. Is it wrong? Yeah. Um, what, what does it cheat you? It cheats you out of learning yourself. Um, but to have a teacher come out and say that, and I felt like she was doing it because, um, you know, that's what the religion taught. And it was such a religious community that I went to high school. And I mean, there were hardly any kids that were outside of the church. What's high school? Uh, I graduated from Riverton High School. Okay. And so, um, like, I just remember feeling like that's why she wrote that is because we're all part of the church. And it was really impactful and really shameful. Mm. And what did you take away from it? I took away from it, like, I'm not going to get away with lying. And I do want to know where my integrity is. And I want my integrity to be in line with honesty. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it was a positive. Yeah, it was a positive, even though I was like mortified. And I literally couldn't look that teacher in the eye Mm -hmm. the rest of the school year. Yeah. Okay. Um, So as you're graduating high school from Riverton High School, are you like, Molly Mormon? Are you like viewed as like super churchy, faithful? Are you having doubts about your faith? Um, I didn't have doubts. Uh, I, I don't think that I was considered Molly Mormon either. I think that it was just, again, like where I grew up, it was just this subculture of like everyone just is this way. And so I, I just didn't have a lot of opinion or thought around anything outside of that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like a bubble. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, yeah, it was. Okay. Okay. So what'd you do after high school? 
Oh gosh, let's see. After high school, I started at the community college. I was just kind of trying to find my way. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, and I wasn't really vested in a lot of opinion around that. And it took me time to, uh, just really develop desire. And, you know, like, I feel like that was kind of like everything around me was just kind of given to me and it, it was what it was. And I never really developed my own opinions and thoughts and feelings about a lot of things. And so I, you know, again, like the values of education, I liked learning. So I went out and I, you know, was taking classes and learning and I just didn't really have direction yet. And this is when, you know, my mother, again, like this really valuing education, um, she started looking into these programs that I could do. And I ended up doing a um, study abroad to Mexico with BYU. And we were international volunteers. And that really opened up my eyes to different ways that other people in the world live. And because we were going there as BYU students, I was like, you know, we are coming in to help save the world and this little orphanage we're working in and, you know, we're making a difference. And that was impactful for me. Um, and it also gave me the idea, maybe I could go to BYU. Um, and so that was, uh, that was one of those things where I was like, okay, like maybe, the, maybe, the, maybe I do want to do this. And I didn't really want to go to BYU cause I actually didn't want to be surrounded by, you know, such an LDS dynamic in school. Um, and I, I don't really know why I had that. I always just had this little bit of like, I want to learn more. I want to learn more. I want to explore more outside of the church, even though I've never gone outside of myself to do that. Um, but the desire started, you know, surfacing. So anyway, I went to, um, so I took a few more semesters of college and then I actually started kind of questioning the church at that point. And I got to a place when I was about 20 where I was like, you know, I don't really feel like I'm into this organized religion thing. Um, I think it's great. I believe in God. Um, you know, I want to have a relationship with spirituality, but you know, like, I don't really see that there's this connection between religion and God. Um, and so my mom kind of was picking up on this and was like, oh, you know, what's happening here? And she found this other program for me to do. It's uh, BYU Nauvoo. And so I went to Nauvoo. I lived there for four months. And I, going into that, I had decided like I'm not going to be religious, but if my mom wants me to do this, it's cool. It's outside of Utah. I want to go, you know, like it's for four months. How bad could it be? And I remember getting there and I was, I hadn't been to BYU other than that study abroad. So I was not steeped in the BYU school culture and it was definitely different from my college experience previous to that. Um, everybody just like, it, not not to blanket statement what everybody was doing, but it just seemed everybody had this like elevated way of living, like smiling all the time and just excited about everything. And I was like, what is so happy about everything? And can I ask for our mm. Never Mormon listeners, explain what why Nauvoo ha had a BYU study abroad. Yes. And what is Nauvoo and what import it it holds in Mormonism. And even the significance of yeah. your mom offering it to you. <laughs> yeah, yes. Exactly. At the time yes. Of yeah. Yeah. So it's this intervention, you know, I've got a daughter that's losing her testimony. Let's send her to <laughs> Nauvoo as a, a Mecca for church history. Like Joseph Smith, uh, was there during, you know, the time that he was alive and that's where he was also killed. And there's a lot of church history that went down in that space. And there's a temple there. It was the first temple that was, um, started, started in Nauvoo. And, um, so right next to the Nauvoo temple, which was reconstructed several years ago, um, cause the original saints that lived there, they never finished it, but they, um, there was a, like a dormitory. And so, the church owned that and, you know, they would have students coming in for semesters at BYU or through BYU at Nauvoo to study church history. Um, we could do all of our religion credits there. And um, and then just it was like tour, touring the whole, like everything within, you know, so many miles of that space. Is it almost like an EFY? Uh, yeah, kind of. Although it was more, I mean, it was very rigorous as far as the schedule. Cause it's like, here's the schedule. Here's all the, 
uh, like here's the his- church history classes you take, here's the religion classes you take. And then there was, I mean, I actually never went to EFY, so I can't, I, I assume it was probably pretty similar. I mean, EFY is like very geared around fun social, social fun. Even the classes are meant to be like highly interactive and fun. It's sounding like the Jerusalem Center BYU study abroad, but you're instead of studying the mm-hmm. Holy Land, you're studying yeah. Mormon yeah. history. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm sure those programs w- mirrored each other. Okay, yeah, because okay. it was very rigorous and academic. Mm. It was social too, but it wasn't like what I hear the stories of EFY, where you're like all singing together and you mm. know having all these like sleepovers and testimony meetings. And I mean, there was some of that, but n- not. It was definitely like more rigorous academically, especially around church history. Were there like steak dances though and Mm-mm. social stuff? No. 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 Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. They, uh, I would imagine they'd be trying to get everyone married off. Oh yeah. They were definitely doing that. It was interesting <laughs> though, because there was like, it was probably like 70% women, 30% men. So there was a lot more women mm. than men there. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. So there was a lot of group dynamic with the men and women. And I, I think... Probably half the men there did find, you know, someone that they went on to marry from that group. Okay. And just for our viewers and listeners, like Nauvoo is really, it, Nauvoo is basically, think of the last four years of Joseph Smith's life from like 1840 to 1844. Mm-hmm. Like prior to that, they'd been kicked out of, you know, left New York, kicked out of Curlin, Ohio, kicked out of Missouri, persecuted you know, extermination orders in Missouri. And it's like the last place Joseph built the city, but this time he was mayor and judge and he built a temple there and he was the commander of the Nauvoo Legion. Mm -hmm. And it ends up where he started doing polygamy Mm -hmm. really in an accelerated pace. He probably married 30 plus women Mm -hmm. during his four years at Nauvoo, Mm -hmm. including all the underage girls, you know, and it's also where he was martyred, killed, you know, put in jail and killed mm-hmm. because he just got too power hungry mm-hmm. and the polygamy thing got out of control and it, they ended up just the surrounding neighbors and the state threw him in jail where he was shot and killed. And mm-hmm. and then that's when the saints had to eventually leave Nauvoo and move to Utah. So it's a really intense, yeah, a really Carthage jail, I'm sure. Yeah, we went to Carthage jail and... Um Liberty Jail, and we went to all those places. They, it was kind of nicknamed the City of Joseph. Yeah. Like, because yeah. that's where he, I mean, that's where he really established himself in the church. And to Margie's point, I'm guessing your mom is thinking, if I send Janae to Nauvoo, she'll get a super strong testimony. Yes. So how, I, how'd, yes. That, how'd your I, mom's wishes go? So uh, it, it played out just as she had hoped. So I remember looking at all these kids and I'm like, oh, you guys are faking this. Like this, there's no way you guys can be this happy. And I I was fairly unhappy at the time. Um, I just think that I was kind of lost trying to figure out what I was going to do and where I was going to go and not super um, like in the culture of Mormonism, which I had grown up in. I was like looking at you know, shifting out of it. And so I just felt like there was a lot of uncertainty in my life. And And I looked at it as like, you know, I'll I'll go try it. And when I got there, I was a little bit, "Mm, I don't know if I'm going to like this. And then after a couple of weeks, you're going to the classes and you're in the, you know, you're surrounded by the people and it's like, okay, maybe I'll open up to this a little bit more. And then I'm getting deeper into the church history classes. And I remember we were studying the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. So I was reading through that book and, you know, the kids were just like commenting on how powerful it was in every class. It would be like, here's a story that directs, um, you know, what is being said in this book to how it's helping me in my life. And, you know, it's just like all this uh, evidence going back and forth about how amazing the gospel is and how helpful it is in your life and how it just kind of to blanket statement, what it does, it solves every problem in your life. And so I'm like, "Mm, okay, I'll try it. So then I was like, I'll make a commitment. I'll do all the things, like all the things everybody else seems to be doing, like the prayers, the scripture study, the going to church, I'll just do it all hundred percent and see what happens. So after a couple of weeks of doing that, I was feeling like, oh yeah, this must be how you get to that place of being really happy. I think I'm happier and, you know, I feel better and, um, I, I, this must be working. And so I remember I was in church and I had kind of like not gone to church and, you know, everybody's like, why aren't you in church? And I'm, I I was like, I just didn't want to go. And anyway, so I was going regularly to church. I'm in sacrament meeting and I just feel this draw to go outside. So it's a beautiful day. 
summertime, go outside, sun shining. And I sit down and this is like this place where Joseph Smith had given many sermons and, you know, there's a podium up there and there's like some seating. And I'm just imagining, you know, what it would have been like for the saints in those early years, listening to the prophet. And I open up my scriptures. And as I'm doing that, you know, it falls open to this verse in the Bible that was along the lines of trust ye in the Lord. Jehovah for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. And as I read the word Jehovah, you know, the trees above me kind of parted and this light came down on the scriptures. And I was like, that's it. That's my answer. Like I am, you know, like this is where I draw the line between questioning and being faithful. And from this point forward, I will never question the church again. Like I know it's true. And I know that this is the path that I'm supposed to be on. And this is the path that I am choosing. And, you know, there's a God that loves me and cares about me and is teaching and guiding and directing me. And that's when I really bought in for my first time in my life ever. And I, w- I felt like that's where I got my testimony. I didn't have one before. It was kind of that concept of, you know, everybody else is doing it, living on bar- borrowed light. This is my culture. This is just what I know. And so I, you can go on that for so long until you can't anymore. And, and I hadn't had an experience until that point that really helped me to feel like it's what I wanted to choose. Mm. Yeah. And I just have to, and that's a beautiful experience that I know meant a lot to you and probably uh, sustained you for a lot of years. I mm-hmm. do have to ask, like, you're in the place he was propositioning 14-year-old girls. Had they, in that city, like, there's the image of Joseph Smith that that the church offers us mm-hmm. oftentimes. Mm-hmm. And then there's all this history mm-hmm. where if we knew it, we might not have that spiritual experience, but because we've been handed kind of an idealized whitewashed version of Joseph Smith, mm-hmm. then when you're a troubled young adult and you're trying to figure out what life means and you're not feeling super happy or connected and you see all these happy Mormon kids mm-hmm. and you've got this idealized version of Joseph in your mind and you're in Nauvoo, you, it, you could say that's very impressionable. Yeah, and then when very. you have these strong feelings mm-hmm. that are affirming, it's like a spiritual experience. But it's almost your—it's Joseph Smith as a caricature, not as actually knowing what he really did. Yeah, because if if they had educated you, well, he propositioned Nancy Reagan's daughter and threatened her and mm-hmm. s- sent a man off on a mission and then married his wife. Like if you knew all the things he did, maybe you wouldn't have had that experience. So I guess that's a long way of me asking. Did they educate you about the real Joseph Smith before you had your theophany? You know? I had no idea. <laughs> I, I'm sitting there in this space and we had just been there and it's like Joseph Smith gave this great sermon and there was light and that the spirit was there. And it, it was like there was like the word of God being given to the people right here. And that was what that space meant to me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I had no idea that at the time I was, you know, I was 19 years old that, you know, like a, the same man giving these sermons was, you know, however, however old he was, 37 or something, propositioning a girl my age. Mm. I would have been like, what? Like 37 is so old. That's disgusting. <laughs> At that time, that's what I would have thought. I would have been like, no way. He never did that. I mean, I just, I wouldn't have believed you if you told me. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So in a way you're led and not nefariously, but mm-hmm. your mom wants you to be a faithful Mormon, mm-hmm. you're led into a scenario where you're, where you don't have real informed consent. Right. You don't have the full information. Right. And then a context is created mm-hmm. where you'll have an emotional experience. And then you've been primed or prompted to interpret those emotions in a very specific way Yeah. to the church's benefit, which is. Yeah. A hundred percent. Well, I mean, I'm living in the city of Joseph. <laughs> there was not one conversation about polygamy ever. <laughs> The entire time I was there. I, what? I, yeah. Not what? Not one. I mean, nothing that I can remember if it was mentioned, it was so, you know. How long were you there? I was there four and a half months. And Unbelievable. I, but the focus there. With like kids, teens, yes. you know, who are internet, with like young adults who are internet savvy. What year is No, this? we weren't. Yeah, the like internet was year? not really. This was 2000. So, I mean, there was the internet. Okay, but okay. We did not have. Oh, we 2000 didn't have, is pre. Yeah. So this was 2003-ish. Okay. We okay. didn't, we didn't, we didn't have smartphones. It was early. So more had, hadn't even started. No, yet. we okay, had that, our, that makes sense. yeah, we had our, um, weekly phone calls that we could make on the phone with the cord, you know, and there were computers there. Yeah. 
and they were, you know, restricted as far as like okay. what we could do that on them. That makes more sense. So yeah, it was not like it is now. Okay. I have a question around yeah. Nauvoo just yeah. because yeah. I, it's been years since I've been there. But as like the town of Nauvoo, is there a history, like a neutral ground where you could have been in the town outside of mm. kind of the Mormon mm -hmm. bubble or lens of it that you might have had information? Like, is that even possible? Yeah. At Actually, that time, do you think? Yes. I'm just curious if like you were out and about if there is a historical lens on Nauvoo that might have mentioned some of those things. Yeah. But you were in a very controlled setting. Yes. Do you so, have any sense Yes. For that? And actually, it's funny that you asked that because it's just bringing up this memory that I had. So there's Nauvoo, all the spaces that the church owned, and the, there's like all of the like reconstruction of like whatever – you know, they were doing at that time. There's the blacksmith shop, there's the, you know, trading right. store, there's all these things, right? And they have missionaries in there that teach about like, you know, what happened in Nauvoo. Well, in, uh, I can't remember what it's called. I think it was like, uh, it, it's like, okay, the, the culture there was the locals. So there's, there's this big influence of the church there. And then there's the locals. Right. And I actually made really good friends with one of the locals and this was actually very, very impactful because he would tell me stories about things that had actually happened in Nauvoo with Joseph Smith and like some different things. And I, I can't believe that I kind of like forgot about this, but I think he is the one that actually opened up my interest for actual reality, historically speaking facts of what happened because he would tell me stories about other things that happened in Nauvoo that I was not learning at the Joseph Smith Center. And as kids, we we weren't allowed to um, like go out without having somebody with us, I think. It was kind of missionary rules. Like you had to have a companion. You had to be home at a certain time. Um, you couldn't be alone with the opposite sex. But it wasn't like... I don't think there was dating allowed among the people. Actually, no, I remember the rule. There wasn't dating among the students, but the students were not prohibited from dating outside the students, but there just wasn't options. So I think it was like this thing where it wasn't like a rule, but it just didn't happen. And this young man happened to be, he was probably around 24-ish. So, and he he took an interest in me dating wise. And um, so we did start to spend some time together. And he'd had quite the past as, as well. And he started kind of telling me some of the stories around like growing up in Nauvoo and, and how isolated it was. And anyway, but then I, I, now I remember him telling me, you know, and, you know, this is another historical piece of this is something Joseph Smith did. And this is another thing Joseph Smith did. And, and he was actually the first one that told me Joseph Smith would drink alcohol mm. in Nauvoo. And I was like, what? Mm -hmm. No, I don't believe you. And he's like, no, it's, you know, like it's part of the history of the city. Like, and you know, it's documented here. And, and I was like, what for real? And it kind of just was like, but that was after the word of wisdom was given. So how could that be? And so I think that actually in Nauvoo, and I've never made this connection before, but in Nauvoo was when I first started thinking wait, there's things that aren't matching here <laughs> Yeah, because of the history. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But you had your spiritual experience. Yeah, but I was there to be a BYU student. I was there to, you know, feel the spirit. I was there to get the shiny eyes that all the BYU students mm -hmm. had. And you got them. Yeah, I got them. Shiny em. eyes. So your mom got her wish. Yes, yes. Okay. And she was very happy, and I was very committed to the church after that. So where'd you go from, from Nauvoo? Uh, from Nauvoo, I made the decision to uh, get into BYU. So I kind of got my, okay. yeah, I got my academic life together. I got an associate's degree. I got my grades high enough to get in and I was accepted. And I, so I went to BYU and that's where I was like, okay, I'm committed to the gospel. I'm committed to the church. I'm committed to this whole thing now. Um, I know what I want to do. I want to go to BYU, find a husband, graduate and, you know, start my Mormon life. Like that was what I had planned. Okay. So you got on the train, the Mormon That's train. Right. Yep. Got your seat. I got my seat, got my ticket, got my seat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, How was BYU? I loved it. I, th I thought that 
I kind of always looked at it as this institution where it was like, okay, this is where like all the best church member goes and the smartest. And I'm not the best church member and I'm not the smartest. So I probably could never get in there. So I felt really proud of myself that I got in. And I also felt really special that I'm now one of the good Mormons and the good church members and the good gospel followers and the smart ones. Mm. So I, you know, I just, I felt like I, I'm actually one of these people now. Whereas before, for whatever reason, I, I, I felt again, like just not part of it. It just was what was around me. Yeah. Mm, interesting. What'd yeah. you study? So I did a social science degree with a family studies emphasis. When I got there, I was pretty committed to, you know, finding a husband and getting married. And so I took more child development classes. And then I thought, you know, I would really actually like to go to law school and do family law. So the social science kind of, um, like tied into that as a, as a good undergrad for law school. And then the family studies, I wanted to do family law. And so it seemed like a good tie. And then if I, didn't end up going to law school. I would have a social science degree with lots of child development classes and that kind of thing. And, you know, it would serve me either way. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of yeah. how I approached that. And how was, how was being a BYU student dating wise and the honor code and all that? Um, well, I, I was kind of in a unique situation where I lived. My grandma lived like maybe a five minute walk from BYU campus. So I lived with her. Um, and because I lived off campus, I didn't really get that on campus experience a lot, especially like when you go there your first couple years. But um, honor code was never an issue for me. I um, I think I, I tried to follow it, but I just didn't really put a lot of emphasis on it. And I didn't worry about it too much. I wasn't really doing anything outside of that. I actually do remember the first time I ever tried alcohol was when I was going to BYU. And it was, what? A, yeah, I know. And it was at a party. And I don't know that I even knew that it was alcohol. The kids were mixing drinks and it was, uh, it was really close to campus. And this like really surprised me because I had never really engaged in like the really rebellious culture, like anything that was a no, no in the culture I didn't do. Um, but now that I was living on my own, I was, I was like, Oh, I kind of you know, like, I, what is that you're drinking? I want to try it. I tried it. I had a sip. It was disgusting. And I was like, Oh, that's horrible. Like, why would people do this? It makes mm -hmm. no sense to me. And I, I want to say, there were BYU and UVSC students there both. And, you know, I, I, it wasn't, I wasn't like looking out for who's BYU and who's not, but I just remember thinking like, this is odd because like I thought at BYU Provo, I wouldn't get any of this. And my previous college experiences, like I had gone to UVU and community colleges, I'd never had any college party that I'd been to that, you know, had drinking or anything like that. Like I'd never been exposed to it. And so to finally get into like this BYU ideal and then like have a party so close to it that was had alcohol at it. It was, it was, it was another thing that was like, this is off to me. And mm. so. Yeah. Okay. So you got exposed to some party stuff at BYU, but overall your experience there yeah. I mean, overall it was good. I, you were, I'm sure you were trying to find your eternal companion before you graduated. Yeah, I was. What and happened? I failed at that. So I didn't get did my have, MRS degree. Boyfriends. Did you get um, engaged? Yes, I actually did get engaged. Not to a guy that went to BYU, to a guy that was, um, I had dated him previously. I met him when I was living in Orem before and, uh, he was 10 years older than me and he, had been divorced. And so I, I kind of like when I met him, I was 19, he was 29. I was like, Oh, that's kind of, that's a big, a big gap, but you know, I'll be friends. And so anyway, um, yes, we got engaged for, uh, reasons that were not the right reasons to get engaged. Um, and it was kind of one of those things where I was like, Oh, I don't really want to go out of BYU, not at least being engaged. And it was kind of one of those things where, mm -hmm. Oh, the timing's good. So I'll just, yeah, I, th sure. This works. Right. And so, I did get engaged, not a BYU student, which I was disappointed about because I really wanted to find a BYU student so we could say we met at BYU. And we, I mean, that's my parents' story. And, you know, like we're true blue BYU students, marriage, everything came from that. But it, it worked well enough. From, from like a more secular point of view now, 
asking this question is going to sound stupid and offensive because mm -hmm. most people don't get married in college and feel right. a pressure to get married when they're 21 or whatever. Yeah. But I'm going to ask you from a Mormon brain, why couldn't you find an eternal companion at BYU? You had three three years there. Mm -hmm. There's lots of return missionaries there. You dated boys. Yeah. Why, what what kept you from being able to find your eternal companion at BYU? Yeah, that's such a good question because when mm. I would come home, people would comment like, "Oh, you still haven't been scooped up yet." You know, like those. What are those BYU boys doing over there? And I was like, uh, I, you know, I don't know. So every time I would go out with somebody, I just I don't know. I just didn't really like I. There was not this connection. Like there were several opportunities I could have had to be engaged in a couple of weeks and married two months later, yeah. you know, but right. I was like, mm. ah, I don't want to, I don't want to do that, mm -hmm. <laughs> which was kind of unique because I did want to get married and be a mother. Like that's what I really wanted. But at the same time, I didn't want to just marry some guy just because he was there. And I think that, I think that that happens a lot more than we realize just because like in proximity, you're just so caught up in the moment. And I would see my friends doing this and I was like, uh, I, I think that's going to be a divorce, you know? And I just didn't want to, I just didn't want to put myself in that position. So even at that point in my life, I had more foresight than I think was kind of yeah. typical for that yeah. age group. And yeah. I think that's why I didn't marry anyone at BYU because I could see far enough ahead that I was like, no, <laughs> Yeah, and, but it was heartbreaking for me because I was like, "Oh, I'm failing at the BYU game." Mm. Yeah, it's like I have a a significant box unchecked. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm. And there's nothing significantly wrong with me. So, yeah, why isn't this happening? Mm. Other than I would just say no. <laughs> yeah, you didn't. Mm. You didn't feel the right person. No, I didn't. You didn't find the right person. No. Yeah. yeah. You said MRS degree. Is that how what yes. they call it? What yeah, the mean? MRS, the Mrs. degree. You yeah. get married and then you get your MRS degree. That's what. That's a big joke at BYU. But you're there to get your MRS degree. Yes, and if you graduate get without getting it, you you failed. Yeah. yeah I yeah. mean, it's all said in good fun, but there's definitely like some structural, yeah. you know, belief around that. Yeah. Okay, so what'd you do when you graduate? unmarried, but engaged to a non-BYU student from BYU. Yeah. Well, okay. So I'm just going to rewind a teeny bit. Okay. My, uh, so after I had had this commitment to the church, I, and I got into BYU, then I was like, okay, what's the next step? I'm not engaged. Oh, well, I guess I should probably go on a mission. So I'm totally committed to like doing everything right in my life, being super integrous, you know, like integrity is my new mantra related to I'm a religious person and I'm, you know, I am just converted. So, okay, I'm going to go out and share the gospel. So one of the challenges, so I'm filling out the, the, you know, sheet for the missionary. One of the challenges I had is in the first couple of years I had struggled with, um, an eating disorder and I, you know, was bulimic for a little while. And, um, I, that's a different story, but I was able to really heal from that. And again, I was in a good place. Like I want to honor my body and I, I want to, you know, respect my body. And this is one of God's gifts to me. And, you know, so that was like one of those things where it was like, I know God can heal me. And I felt like that that had happened. And so as I'm, um, so it'd been months and months and I was just in a really good place still, and just really gung ho on the church and on the questionnaire for the missionary, uh, um, form that you fill out. It's like, do you, it's one of the questions was, do you have a, an eating disorder in the last, I can't remember the wording of the question. Now I, I didn't feel like at the time I did, but I had struggled with it. So mm -hmm. I checked yes. So I had gone through my bishop's interview. I'd gone and he referred me to the stake president. I'm going for my final interview. So I've gone through all the steps. I've got the immunizations, you know, I've, I've done all the things and my stake president looked at that question and he was like, mm, you know, sister, I think we should wait six months. And I'm just like, what? Devastated. Because now I have to go out of this interview and say, like, what do I say? He said, no, I couldn't go on a mission. And it was because I was honest and I'm not even struggling with this thing anymore. And like, I'm ready to share the gospel. And like, the Lord should know my heart. Like he, the Lord should know my heart and the stake president should have felt yeah. that. And I am just really confused as to why when I'm being a hundred percent honest, not because it's a struggle now, but because it's something I did struggle with. Why am I being denied this opportunity when I know how whole I am right now, when I know how ready I am to go teach the gospel and 
you know, like everybody's just waiting for me to get my mission call, you know, and mm. now I'm going to walk out of this interview and what am I going to say? And explain so hard. to non-Mormons why, w- what it means when all your family and ward members know you're going in to do an interview for your mission. And then you come out and say something like, uh, they told me to wait six months. What goes through the minds of everyone? I, I think that the first thing is like, oh, you did something wrong. You got to repent. Like what? It's usually related to morality. Like um, you had sex or. Yeah. Like you had sex around. or something like that. Or, you know, like I, I don't mm-hmm. even know, or you have a problem with masturbation. Those are typically the things Born that missionaries. Yeah. Sex. Um, and for me, it wasn't any of those things. And so I was like, people are going to think that about me yeah. Yeah. and it's not true. And like, I'm embarrassed about this phase of my life. So I'm not going to tell the truth about that either. It's not that I was going to lie. Cause I was committed to being very honest, but I was like, that's something I'm keeping to myself. Which phase? Um, the whole like eating disorder thing. Okay. Like I had, I had struggled with that privately and I didn't like my family didn't oh, know about didn't it. Want to tell Cause everybody. then you're in a position right. of trying to explain like, exactly. Oh, really? It's not, it's not that, but you're not, you're not comfortable saying, but I don't necessarily want to tell my yeah, whole war. Like, yeah, okay, don't worry disorder. everyone. It's not that I had yeah, sex. It's yeah. that I had an eating disorder. Yeah. And you it's didn't like, want to have that right. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. you know, I've worked really hard to heal myself from this and get to a better place where I feel comfortable with myself and my eating and my body. And I just don't want, like, I don't want to talk about it. Which makes all the sense. Yeah. And so I was like, oh my gosh, like people are going to think that, yeah, I like am immoral or unchaste and I'm not, you know? And so I just remember walking out of there thinking like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And, you know, my mom's waiting in the car and she's so excited and she's like, how did it go? And I'm like, oh, I'm just, I think I'm going to wait a little bit. I don't feel quite ready to go. And Mm. she was like, you know, disheveled, like what? And she she didn't ask and she didn't ask any questions. And, you know, I definitely wasn't going to tell her. And, you know, that's something I don't know that I ever told her, but that was the reason why it was because I had marked yes on the eating disorder thing. And, you know, missionaries at the time were struggling heavily with, um, a lot of mental issues. Like Mm -hmm. it was, so I think that they were telling the stake presence, you know, if there's any issues, just, just have them wait because there's so many problems coming out into the mission field with this type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also just knew that it would not be a struggle for me and, you know, it wouldn't have been. And it's just like, that's like, my heart was so pure at the time. Like I just knew I was ready to serve the Lord. And I just felt so almost betrayed that my heart wouldn't have had, wasn't seen in that moment. And that it was a, a you know, like this logistical question that mm-hmm. prevented me from that. So, so then like back to this engagement. So then, you know, this guy comes back into my life just a few weeks later and we kind of start dating and he's like, let's get married. Like we've known each other for four years. And in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, okay, that's a great idea because I just said, I don't feel ready for my mission. This will be a great cover for that. Oh, like, oh, I see. you know, I wasn't supposed to go because I was supposed to get engaged. Look how the Lord works, you back know. Back on plan. Yep. We're right back on track <laughs> and everything's good and I'm not embarrassed anymore. And people aren't going to think they're just going to be like, oh, look, the Lord had other plans in store for you. And so it just fell into line perfectly. And um, he was more on on brand of the kind of guy that I thought I could see myself with. Like, he, And so it just seemed like this is the option. And you say he was divorced. Mm-hmm. He had kids. He didn't have kids. Okay. Um, he he was actually he was he had married one of the general authority's daughters, and one of the general authorities um, had married them, uh, mm. and one who later became a prophet. But um, and oh. you know it's yeah it's past past. <laughs> but there were there one of one of the reasons that I was really excited about this guy is he had these inner Mormon connections, even though he Mm -hmm. was not part of that family anymore, he had those connections and he would make little references to how he was going to be, you know, probably called as a general authority in, in the future, you know, and he was going to travel and do missions and do all these things. And I was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to travel and I want to be part of the Mormon elite. And I want to know all the general authorities and I want to be in that world, you know, and (laughs) He, he would never say things directly because it was more one of those ideas where it's like, I have to say it very subtly, but you know what I mean. Wait, but if he's divorced from the general authority's daughter or granddaughter. Yeah, granddaughter, gonna, granddaughter. They're not, they're not going to. 
call them as the general authority then. No, nope. I, he I he mean, who knows? But yeah. like, uh, yeah. Okay. But he had it, touched. Yes, that, he had the touched the garment. Circle. He had touched, he touched the, the hem of the garment. Yes, he okay. had touched the hem of the and garment. And I can see for you too. It's it. It kind of goes back to the special. Yes, like, mm-hmm. I am. You know, you're having that feeling again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And where I'm committed, you know, and I've got my own testimony. It's like, I, I want to give my whole life to the church and the gospel and what better way than to serve missions and, you know, serve in the leadership. And mm, yeah. that's what we're going to do. Like okay. I can, I can see that in my future. And All so right. as I can see that as a vision, it's like, okay, this works out really great timing wise. Now I don't feel embarrassed anymore. I'm going to say yes. So what happens? So we we get engaged and it, it turned into a very tumultuous year long engagement that just a lot of issues came out with the the type of person that he was, my reasoning for saying yes, it was all wrong. So I ended up moving out of the state to kind of get some space from him to keep myself in a space where he couldn't continue to manipulate, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So you've and these are I, I just want to know the ping, the almost like the pinball decision making yes. that you're making about really critical life decisions based on really unnatural things like pressure to get married yep. early, mm-hmm. pressure to get on the Mormon train. Oh, better go on a mission because I didn't graduate from BYU, which is a major decision. Yeah. Uh, it's like I didn't graduate from BYU with a husband. Mm-hmm. So bing, obviously I gotta go on a mission. Right. Oh, bing, my my bishop wanted to delay me. Bing, I better get engaged. Yeah. Bing, oh, the engagement didn't work out. Yeah. Better move. <laughs> yep. Like that's a lot of ping pong. Yeah, it's pinball. a lot yeah. of reactionary decisions yeah. based on yeah. the path I should be on that's not working out the way I thought it should be, and based on what other people think in yeah, reality. Yes. And that's like, yeah, that's a hard place to be when you're making life decisions based yeah. on how you feel other people perceive you. Well, it doesn't set you up to make the best decisions for you. No. Right? Right. No, but can we just recognize though, the vulnerability in you being 19 mm-hmm. and then a 29 year old who, as you say, has these cre- these credentials that within the church world are something. Mm-hmm. Um, And still you have a level of discernment to make the call around, you know, being manipulated and creating space. And that's formidable for a 19-year-old. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm really grateful that I had that. And I think that's something I've always been good at without knowing it. Like it's kind of been a little bit more natural. And as I've gone on to develop it, I'm very aware now, but at the time... I just remember observing. I like to observe things and then make, you know, judgment calls, decisions. And there was a lot to observe. And my original decision to, you know, leave the church before I went to BYU Nauvoo was I'm observing all these people in this religion. And it it doesn't seem like they're actually like really better off than anybody else. (laughs) You know, like the marriages aren't better The you know, it's just like, eh, I don't. I don't see it as beneficial. The one thing I kept going back to every time, and this is another, you know, cultural side note around like what kind of kept me from saying I will leave the church was the temple. It's like there's no other church that has temple covenants that can keep families together. So even though I'm questioning it, Mm -hmm. that is one point that I can't dispute. I can't argue. I can't find anywhere else. So I'm going to pin that one because I don't know what to do about it yet. And I want that. And I also think that led to me like still being open to like, well, I want to be converted. So. Makes sense. Yeah. So the engagement didn't work out. Yeah. So I moved to Arizona. I went back to school. I started a master's degree in business and education, quit both of those because I was like, "Eh, I still don't know what I want to do. Um And then this is where my wonderful mom, again, she was like, oh, you know, if my daughter finds somebody out in Arizona, she's going to live there and I want my grandkids to be close to me. So my life goal at the time was to buy a house and her and my dad had just bought this um, uh, foreclosure at auction uh, in Salt Lake area. And it was just little, this little condo and it was in my price range. And so they're like, why don't you just come home and come look at this condo? If you, if you like it, we'll sell it to you for what we bought it for. And I was like, well, okay. You know, that sounds great. So I went there, loved it. I was like, yeah, I totally want to buy it. So by this time I'm 23, still not married, didn't go on a mission, 
my engagement has been broken off. It's like, okay, what else can I do to now kind of like negate all these things I haven't done? So I'm still feeling like I'm progressing. It's like, okay, buy a house. So I bought a house. I bought this house. I moved back to Utah. Um, and that's where I met my husband. And he had bought a, a town home in that same complex. And uh, my dad tells this story when he was at auction, they were bidding for the this condo and, you know, it just went a little higher. And he's like, the spirit just told me, you know, bid one more thousand higher. And, you know, then the other person did and it's like, okay, I'm out. And then he, she's like, I just felt this nudge, you know, one more thousand higher. And so he did. And then he ended up getting it. And then that was the condo that I bought. And then that's where my, I met my husband. And so, you know, it was this story of like, you know, you've been led and guided to this place to meet this person at this time. And when I was at the county, you know, judge where they were doing the auction. It's like, I just, I felt this prompting and it's like, yeah, yeah. Okay. This is, I'm on, I'm on track. I'm on track still. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Instead of just self-exploration, you're like trying to meet some arbitrary dead deadline that's been handed to you. Yeah. I'm miss- feeling like there's something wrong feeling like, yeah. You know, and I'm listening behind. to what everybody else is saying. Yeah. And I'm saying, yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. That's okay. Now I can make a decision because you told me, you know, that the spirit told you to bid higher on this, which means it, it, you know, it was obviously meant for me versus, you know, like, is this the right space for me? Like if I would have just asked that question, is it, do I really want to move back to Utah? Do I really want to buy a house in this? You know, I didn't ask myself those questions. Yeah. I listened to what was being said around me and I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I'll do that because I heard that, I observed it, I heard it, I still made a decision, but I wasn't asking myself the questions. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so what happened? So I got back on track. I My husband and I dated for six months, or no, I'm sorry, a year. <laughs> And after six months, my dad was like, why haven't you guys gotten married yet? And we were both kind of like, well, you know, like. And tell us, tell us his name again. Grant. Grant. Okay. Yes. So you meet Grant. So I meet Grant. We just totally like hit it off. We've got such a great story. He, we, we meet at ward prayer. We lock eyes across the room. Is this single, a singles ward kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, singles ward. Okay. And so we're at ward prayer, which is where all the. Um, youth get together on, or the, the young adults get together on a Sunday. Cause it's like, how many opportunities can we have to get young adults together? Oh, we're going to say a prayer every Sunday night, you know, and then That's we're going to have right. an activity on this day. Then we're going to do this. <laughs> so we're at word prayer. It's after church, you know, and someone had said, Oh, that's Grant Thompson. He lives in your condo complex. And I was like, Oh, I need to talk to him because I just bought this condo and I want to find out, is he renting it? Did he buy it? I want to find out what rent rental rates are. So, you know, like we're all in the room. I'm at the corner of one side. He's at the other corner. We're folding our arms. We're saying the prayer. We open our eyes and say, amen, you know, and I just lock eyes with him and walk clear across the room. And I'm like, are you Grant Thompson? And he's kind of like, yes, <laughs> who are you? Cause I'm new, you know, and I want to make friends. And, um, so then I was like, you know, can you answer some questions about the area? And, you know, so then we got together and we started talking and, um, kind of hit it off. And this is when text messages were just starting. So we started texting each other back and forth and yeah. And he just, he was just somebody that was really, really incredible and unique to me. And he had grown up in Canada. Uh, he was a pilot, so he had his career established and he had bought this house. He was renting it out to roommates. Um, and that's kind of where we connected. Cause I was doing the same thing as a young woman, you know, and he was impressed with that. And, and so, you know, like we started developing a friendship. He started dating somebody else and I was like, eh, okay. And, you know, things progressed with us in a really um, slow, healthy pace. And that had never happened before in any of my other dating relationships. It's like, you got a few times, like, are you going to get married or not? And yes, it's like- Yes, forced eh. a little more pressure. Yeah. And at this point I was just kind of like, I, I think I'd kind of also already resigned myself to like, I may never get married. I may just be an old maid. You know, at 23, I'm thinking this. <laughs> I've, maybe I've timed out. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'm too old now and oh. never going to get married. Uh, but anyway- I, when we met, it was like, it was, it was real. And it was a real like possibility to find like, what is it we both want? And we had more things to talk about than just 
like, we got to get married and what do you want to do? And let's go out to ice cream. So, and I think part of that had to do with, you know, we were both, we had both bought a house. We were both trying to establish our lives. And like, I think I for sure was starting to see life isn't this illusion of all these things around you and they just work all the time. You know, I, I, I think I'd have had enough experience now that I was starting to realize, like, I need to be in charge of making decisions for myself. And if something's going to happen, I need to make it happen. Like nobody outside me is going to make it happen. And I'm always waiting for someone to tell me what to do. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like you had a really healthy courtship with Grant? Yeah, we did. We dated for a year. And, you know, after six months, people were like, why are you guys not married yet? Are Mm -hmm. you guys going to get engaged? Like, what's going on? Like, what's how how come this isn't progressing? And even my dad kind of took Grant aside and was like, why haven't you asked her to marry you yet? Like, what's what's taking you so long? You know, and I don't know that my dad remembers that. But anyway, you know, but Grant and I talked about it and we laughed about it, you know, and it's like, yeah, I I think this is great. And he was actually coming from a place. He's like, well, I want to date for like three years. And I was like, whoa, (laughs) three years. That's a long time. I'm going to be really old by then. So so I basically just said, I'm willing to date for three years. However, after a year, if you know that you like, if you don't know you want to continue dating me and be with me and like work towards marriage, I will start dating other people, but I'll still date you. And he was like, oh, <laughs> so that kind of, um, it, it just kind of like prioritized us to each other. And then after a year, um, he went up into this mountain and asked God if he should marry me. And he saw this cactus flower and he brought the cactus flower down and, you know, he said, God said yes. And so then we, you know, went to Hawaii and got engaged and it was magical. Oh, so you, you feel like you had a happy, healthy courtship and yes. kind of a magical engagement. Yes. And we, you know, so my parents dated for two months and got engaged uh, were married shortly after that. I was born nine months later. So there, there's kind of followed that more standard Mormon time frame of just fast. And I just felt like I wanted to get to know my partner and like delve through all these issues that I could see coming up that yeah. I feel like they should be dealt with before you get married. Yeah. And so I feel like we created this really solid foundation of friendship and communication and, you know, talking about finances and all the things that kind of make a, a marriage relationship work when you actually commit to it. And so by the time we got married, you know, we were ready. And one of the things that was kind of unique about us, um, Grant grew up in Canada and he became a pilot. And when he did his pilot training, before he started any of his training, he went and he interviewed several pilots and was like, how did you get from where I'm at to where you are now? And he kind of drew this line between these stories of efficiency. Like what are all the points that they kind of made as far as, you know, how you get to this outcome you want in the most efficient, successful way. So we took that into our dating and, you know, we went around and interviewed couples that we could see had a good relationship. And we were like, tell us about your relationship. What makes it good? How do you guys, you know, work through issues? What are some of the routines that help you? You know, what are your success secrets. And so we did that and that's amazing. Yeah. It gave us a lot of insight and, you know, we felt really prepared. Yeah. Hmm. I, you know, reflecting, that's really interesting too, how you left BYU with this sense of letdown Mm -hmm. or like personal failure that Mm -hmm. you weren't able to, and almost to confusion. Like, I don't know what went wrong there. Yeah. Like I feel like to this place though, where it plays out and gives you your own, you know, you have your own story now that's mm-hmm. really quite different than yeah. likely the story you you would have had within the BY, BYU structure. Yes. And I just, I love that. Yeah. I love that for you, that there's this moment where you're viewing it as kind of a negative or a loss of mm-hmm. some sort, but then you tell the rest of the story and it gives you something it's actually really, really valuable to you. Yeah. And another lesson I tied back to that whole experience is when I was engaged to this first guy, I felt like I was not the best version of myself with him. Like I didn't really love the person I was when I was with him. And I was like, why are these less than my favorite qualities about myself coming out more when I'm around him? 
you know, and then I met Grant and I was like, wow, like all the best parts of myself are coming out with him, Mm -hmm. you know, and I really like the person I am when I'm with him and he brings out the best in me. And so that was a really good contrast. So then I, I I tied that to like, well, that's why I had that experience. Like the Lord wanted to teach me appreciation and how to really see, you know, contrast. Because if I hadn't had that horrible experience, I wouldn't be able to really Uh, appreciate and enjoy this great experience. And that's the whole purpose of life. It's this, you know, you come to earth, get a body, gain experience. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So how was the wedding? And, and, uh, and I guess, let's see, you may have already said this. Did you attend the temple, take out your endowment right, right before your Yeah. Right before. Yeah. Mm, Yeah. So how was the Temple, your temple experience and how was the wedding and Yeah. So, um, so we flew back, our engagement was actually really short. We had dated for probably actually a year and a half and our engagement was only three weeks (laughs) because once we knew, we knew, and Mm -hmm. we just wanted to take the next step. So we called our friends and family and we're like, Hey, we're going to fly back to Hawaii. We're going to get married in the Laie temple on this day. It's in three weeks. If you can make it, we'd love to have you. If not, we totally understand, but we're doing it. And at this point we had kind of made this decision, like this marriage is about us. It's about what we want. It's about our covenants. It's about, you know, the promises we're making and we're just going to do what we want and we're not going to worry about what everybody else wants. And part of that was coming from this place of like, you know, this is the life I create and I don't want to have this big Mormon wedding with a reception at the church and all of that stuff. So we just, we were like, we want to get married in a beautiful place. So that's kind of what we did. And like a week before we left for Hawaii, I went through the Salt Lake Temple. I really wanted to do the Salt Lake Temple because they have the live sessions. Mm-hmm. Um, and that just felt really special to me. And I remember walking in and I just felt like I've made it. Like I am, I'm here and, you know, this is the epitome of where I've wanted to be and yeah. to get. And I've got uh-huh. a marriage that's about to happen. And now I'm going to get to learn the secrets of what goes on in the temple. And I'm just super excited. And, um, I thought it was a little interesting, but I was just in this like happy, happy state that I didn't feel like looking at, you know, anything that was done in the temple. I was just kind of like this overwhelm of like, I got to make sure I'm following the directions and doing Mm -hmm. all the things. And I feel nervous and I feel super happy and excited. And, um, so I just kind of, it was one of those experiences again, where I was just like, okay, I'm just going to let this happen. And, it's just going to be until I can have time to kind of process it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Almost you have to kind of go through that to get to the thing you want. And also how yeah. hard, what the journey had been to get there. Yes. This and person. the other aspect of that is, well, we're going to get married in the temple in a week. So like I have to do all these things. Yep. And there's no, like, there's not a question of whether I want to do it. There's not a question of if I'm okay with everything. It's just, this is the process you follow Mm -hmm. to get this outcome. And I was committed to following the process. So I, I didn't even look at it with any degree of, you know, skepticism or oddity or, you know, I, I definitely saw that there was interesting aspects to it, but I was like, well, if this is what my parents have been doing for years and years, it's, it's gotta be the way you do things. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. And so you got temple married in the. Laie Hawaii temple. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And there you're on it. You're on the Mormon train. You did it. You got your, you got your return missionary. You got your eternal companion. Yep. I, I know what you're supposed to you know, do next as far as the Mormon train goes. Yep. How's You're that go? to have a baby. <laughs> um, well, you know, again, we wanted to take some time to wait. Like we wanted to establish. So we really liked the pattern of dating for a year and establishing what we wanted for our marriage. So we wanted to have, be married for a year and kind of establish our marriage and then, you know, add a family member to it. So, um, but, you know, my husband knew how excited I was about having a baby and I didn't want to push him, but I, he knew I was really eager to, you know, like take the next step. So, um, I remember six months after we were married, he leaned over and whispered in my ear. He's like, we can start trying for a baby now if you want. And I was like, what are you serious? You know? And I was really excited because I was committed to waiting for a year. And he's like, well, yeah, I mean, it takes like nine months to get here. So we're, we'll still be married over a year by the time the baby gets here. And you know, like if you really want to have a baby sooner, we can try. And I was so excited. So we, um, you know, we started trying for a baby. I got pregnant right away. And, um, 
I miscarried that baby. And so mm-hmm. then I was like, wow, this is like my first baby. What if I'm not going to be able to have kids now? So it was another thing like, oh man, okay. I thought I was all good. And now this is, there's another, you know, speed bump here. Like, you know, what if I have problems getting pregnant? Cause this is my first pregnancy. And I just, you know, I was really, really inwardly nervous and scared about like my ability to continue on this path and this plan that I had set out for myself because, you know, like things were just still in my mind supposed to work out the way you planned them. (laughs) Yeah. Especially if they kind of follow the plan, right? Yeah. So had you ever, I, I have, had you ever considered that as a reality for yourself? Had it ever been talked about this idea of like some women, you know, have a really hard time getting pregnant and yes. some women can't get pregnant mm-hmm. or or was that like a whole new reality for you? Do you remember how you... So it wasn't because I, I remember growing up with, you know, motherhood is the most important thing. And if a woman can't get pregnant, that's like the saddest thing that can happen to a woman. It's just so hard. And it's, I mean, it's the worst thing that a newly married woman could be cursed with in my mind. That's how I kind of interpreted it. And so I was just like, oh my gosh, what if I have that curse? You know, like what if I can't have children? I, I'll be worthless in the whole scheme of Mormon exactly. motherhood. I will be worthless. Exactly. And so it really was coupled with a lot of fear. And 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 what's interesting about that is I don't think that I even took thought to grieve losing a pregnancy. I was just so scared about my ability to have children that I didn't even like process that whole experience. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And that makes so much sense to me, that experience and how you processed it. Yeah. And I was just so anxious to get on to the next try so that I could see like, is it going to happen again or can I actually have a baby? Mm -hmm. What does does it mean mean for me? Yeah. Cause I mean, doctors were like, well, you know, like this is pretty common. It happens. Like just try again when you're ready. And I was like, but like, what does it mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, you know, I think a, a lot of the focus for today's interview is going to be on kind of when Grant passes and managing life afterwards. Mm-hmm. You were married how long before he passed away? We were married, I, we were coming up on our 13th wedding anniversary. Okay. Yeah. So you had four children with Grant in those yep. 13 years mm-hmm. and you built a really successful, super successful YouTube channel at the time, one of the top YouTube channels in the world. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It still is, but I mean, even more so, I guess you were saying a few years ago, how yeah. do we condense, how do we tease out the most relevant portions of those 13 years Yeah. to, to make sure we distill the important stuff mm-hmm. for what comes later? Yeah. um, Yeah. That's a great question. So just, it it was just a wild ride. It was like, okay, we had this miscarriage. I got pregnant again. We had a healthy baby. And from that point, it just continued to follow the plan again, you know? And it was like, I never had a problem getting pregnant again. Every time we wanted to have a baby, we were able to. And, you know, as we continued to add to our family and, you know, Grant was working and I was taking care of the kids, it was like, everything's, we're playing our roles perfectly. Everything's working out the way it needs to be working out. Our business is growing. Um, there is this little thing that, you know, is kind of exciting posting videos on YouTube. It was more of like a lifestyle type thing. It's just something that, you know, we did. And then we started seeing it as a business. And then, you know, that did become our primary focus that and our family became our two most important values for how we spent our time. And at that point, you know, we had, established ourselves as, you know, adults, married couple, homeowners, um, you know, all the things that kind of encompass responsibility and the things you look at as a child and you're like, wow, that's what I want to be when I grow up. Like they're doing all the things like I'm now doing everything my parents did. So I felt like we had made it to that point. Um, you know, we went to church every Sunday. That was a non-negotiable. Like we were both really committed to that. Um, we were not super, temple attendance goers until, you know, I kind of brought it up and was like, well, you know, like this is part of a really important aspect of what we do and we're not prioritizing it because we're working. And so it's like every time something would come up, we would address it and we would find a solution. So we started going to the temple every month and that became on our calendar. It was like every second 
Tuesday of every month we'd go to the temple mm. or every second Thursday. And then, you know, it's like, oh, you know, we're both working a lot. I'm with the kids and, you know, you're doing the YouTube thing and we're figuring out the finances and we're not connecting. And so, you know, like, what do we need to do to remedy that? Oh, we need to have a specific date night. So Tuesday night was our date night. Every single Tuesday night we had a date night. So we could start oh. counting on these things. And we, we, we created this environment of stability and prioritizing what was most important to us so that we could not miss out on, you know, even though we were so busy and our focus was to build this business, we weren't, we didn't want to miss out on the important things. And so that's kind of how we operated. Like we create a system for everything. That's amazing. The level of awareness and to your life and what's important and then your ability to reflect in process with all the, you know, mm -hmm. all the demands of life coming mm -hmm. in and then edit accordingly, yeah. like yeah. literally make changes. Um, that says a lot for your partnership. Did it feel yeah. like a partnership? Like if you felt something um, strongly that, um, you know, within your marriage you were heard and that you oftentimes would, you know? Yeah, have yeah, uh, yeah, hundred percent. I feel like we had such a good open communication and, you know, we brought up things freely. We were honest about just about everything, you know, that I know of that we could be honest about. And, you know, we would say the things that, and, and this is where, you know, I kind of go back to this question, like, can you ask the hard questions and really be willing to get the answers? And that's part of an aspect of relationship that when you're communicating with each other, can you say the things that are not just the flowers and roses or the things that you want to hear or the things that you're used to? And can you really lean into answering them without taking it personally or without being offended? And if you do take it personally, and if you are offended, can you process through that so we can get to the information so that we can really connect? Yeah. And, and we had a really good formula for doing that mm. for, you know, the majority of our marriage. That's so rare. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It really is yeah. a rare... Yeah. Yeah. So how many years between your marriage and your like living off of your social media? Like, um, like yeah. as a full time income? So I think, so Grant actually stayed employed as a pilot for oh, till like 2017 ish. So we mm. kept our, we kept our full time employment. He cut his hours way back. Um, like income wise, we probably from when we started in 2011, we probably could have retired him from the job like within a couple of years. But it was this security piece like we had insurance to get your own business and get your own insurance. It like is like astronomically more expensive. And we were just kind of afraid to take that last leap outside of the like the structure of having employment, mm -hmm. but we were fully running our own business and, you know, making plenty of money to sustain ourselves within like a couple years. Okay. So you're married what year again? So we married 2007. Okay. Started YouTube in 2008, but we actually started the, like what it is now in 2011. Okay. And, um, yeah, by this time, so 2011, so I remember 2013 in January was when we hit a million subscribers. And I remember 2000 that- what? 2013, or no, 2014. 14. Yeah, so it was okay. just January of 2014. And I remember that because I had had my third baby in 2013 in December, mm. and he was just like this teeny tiny baby on the carpet next to dad's desk as we were like, oh, we had a million, you know? And he was just like mm. barely moving around because he was so little. I mean, it's amazing <laughs> yeah. that he's- teaming with you to create a successful YouTube channel while he's a full-time pilot or yeah. part-time eventually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that you're having two, three, four kids and mm -hmm. then you're able to partnership together to create. Mm -hmm. Like if someone was doing that full-time, they would have a hard time doing yeah. that without kids. Yeah. So it's kind of amazing. Yeah. Um, just going back to it, I'm like, wow, yeah, we were doing a lot. <laughs> do you want to, do you want to just talk just briefly about the invention of the idea of the King of Random or TKOR and kind of how it blossomed from just an idea into a full-time. Yeah. Career. So, uh, before we, um, bought our first house, we rented this basement apartment. Our goal was to, again, like we go back to our goals and our systems and our goal was to buy a house for cash. And we wanted to buy our first house with cash. So we didn't have a mortgage. So we moved into this super tiny, uh, basement apartment 
and rent was like 800 bucks included everything. And so we just saved our money and worked as hard as we could, but we spent a lot of time together because we just didn't have much going on outside of this goal and working. So during this time we started like Grant just like loved experimenting. So we'd put these experiments together and we'd try them in the basement and like they just turned into the content that, so for that two years, we lived in that basement apartment and saved all our money. We just experimented. And then our first video was done in that apartment. It was a fire with a water bottle video and it got like, it went viral. It got like a hundred thousand views, which at the time, mm-hmm. you know, there wasn't anything, there was nothing that had a million views. There was things that had five views. So you get a hundred thousand views. It's like, whoa, this is like viral. Um, so then we moved into our house where we established the King of Random and that's when, you know, everything started coming together. But that's also where we were like, okay, let's actually focus on this and make it a business versus just a hobby. And so we just, we branded everything from the beginning as if it were going to be a business, not just a hobby anymore. So we took that from, let's just do this to let's, let's create this business around it so that, you know, we're, we're starting to see people get subscribers and, you know, have income on YouTube and, you know, like, why don't we just do that? And so we did that from the very beginning. Yeah. But that feels like I remember starting podcasts a decade before anyone had even thought about monetization of podcasts. Mm-hmm. Um, and still people have a hard time with it, but, mm-hmm. but it must, you probably didn't know a lot of people that were making a full-time living off of their YouTube channel. No, we, there was nobody <laughs> yeah. until we heard a news story of someone mm-hmm. that had done it once. <laughs> right. And we were like, Whoa, you can make a living off this. That's kind of <laughs> cool. Well, we'll set it up as a second business and just, you know, have fun with it. And what, whose idea was it to do science education and come up with a name and how'd that happen? Yeah. So the name was given to us by a friend. A friend came over and was like, man, you guys are always doing like the weirdest things at your house. Like you're always doing these random projects. And he's like, man, dude, you're like the king of random. And so that's kind of where it came from. And that, um, it wasn't taken and it kind of gave us the liberty to, you know, explore whatever it was we wanted to do. Cause we didn't know, like we want to do science. It just kind of fell into that category. Okay. And so you just, you just went with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we just went with it and. Did y'all grow up on Bill Nye? Did you have him? Yeah, I did. Um, I know Grant did a little bit, but he, he wasn't super into exploring and learning either. It was both of us kind of lived this childhood where we didn't like super engage with the world around us. It was just like everything was happening to us and we were getting to this space. And then once we found each other and got married, it's like this insatiable curiosity and desire to learn, like just kind of overtook both of us. And we were like, there's so much more to the world than we ever could have imagined. And like we want to know it all. And so it just really became this like insatiable curiosity that we both had to ask questions and get answers and ask questions and get answers. Interesting. Yeah. Fun. Well, what an amazing ride you guys have had. And that, I think the story of, of TKOR kind of could be its own epic for yeah. an hour more stories interview. Yeah, for sure. How, so how would you describe the health and obviously only share what you're comfortable. How would you share how the health of your marriage and then the health of your testimonies progressed Mm -hmm. towards the middle and end of your time together? Yeah. So I I think one of the things we loved about each other is we were both committed to the gospel, but we weren't overly zealous about it. Like we could kind of just engage in life while this is a part of our life, but we were both like really committed. I think um, this is also where I really started to desire and have a, uh, like a deep yearning to learn. Like when they say, you know, like study the scriptures and learn the doctrine. And that's when I was like, okay, I want to, like, I want to know now, like, what is this really that I've committed to, you know? And Grant had kind of done that on his mission and, uh, he had a, you know, an intense mission experience. And after that, he kind of just put that away and was like, okay, I've done the mission thing. I've done the church thing. Like I I still have a testimony. I want to be involved, but I have like done the deep work and I'm not going back to that, but I hadn't experienced that yet. And so I started really like digging deep into the gospel, into the scriptures. I wanted to, you know, ask questions at church and like be involved. And I wanted to go to the temple and I wanted to have family scripture study and family prayer. And, you know, he, he didn't really want to do any of those things. Um, and so I was kind of always like leading those discussions, like, well, can we start 
reading scriptures with the kids? Can we start having discussions about the gospel? Can, you know, like you're the priesthood holder, can, like this is your job. You're supposed to be kind of doing this. Like, will you do it? And he's kind of like, eh, it's not like, mm, it's not that big of a deal. We like, we'll learn as we go. Like let's, he, he just didn't want to prioritize it with intention. I really wanted it to be intentional. And so this is kind of where we like, we didn't fight about this at all, but this was always like a source of conflict where I was always wanting it and he was resisting and, you know, and, and we slowly incorporated it in, into our family. Um, so I would say like, so you were trying to ramp up your Mormon game yeah, and he wasn't, he was into it, but not super zealous. Right. Yeah. Not and super you were zealous. feeling a little bit of frustration. It's like, come on, man, let's get into this and do it. Yeah. Like this is your responsibility. It says here in the proclamation, <laughs> like, you know, you gotta, <laughs> yeah. you gotta follow the, follow the rules here. And so, um, he was always open to those discussions, but like when I would ask him for a blessing, he'd be like, ah, oh, you don't really need a blessing. Like you, you'll just get better. And I'm kind of like, wait, like, how are we supposed to exercise our faith if we do that? If, if we just, you know, do the things that'll make us better versus getting the blessing that's supposed to heal, you know, and, and he was, he's always been more of that logical scientific mind, which is kind of where the channel came from in that, you know, like he wants to know the nuts and bolts of how things actually work. And so I think that he kind of filtered religion through that a little bit as well, which made it so he could see the logic of it. And it's like, well, like, yeah, maybe a blessing will give you comfort, but like, it's probably not actually going to heal you. And I know there's stories and all that, but like, it, it's just a process. And if, if yeah. you have faith in it, great, it supports that. But, you know, like you've got to do the things. And so that was always like part of where he was coming from is this really logical space where I was like, no, let's just like have all the faith in the world and be the most spiritual people. And, you know, like everything will be magical for us. And, you know, that's why we're having so much success is because, you know, we're a good Mormon family and you know, the Lord's blessing us and we're paying our tithing and, and he really loved paying tithing. Um, and I just really loved trying to like build our family culture around the gospel. And so as we were building this, it's like, now there becomes three things. It's like committing our lives to the Lord, building our business, taking care of our kids and family. And so in that, you know, we, we made a lot of other sacrifices, anything outside of that didn't fit into our lives because mm -hmm. we were so busy. Um, you know, we didn't have friends. We didn't go out. We didn't do activities with our kids. We stayed home. We built our business and we went to church in the temple. And that's kind of our, that's what our life was primarily consisting of it for years. Mm. And did that change in those last couple of years or was that pretty much all the way through? Yeah. Um, so once we got our business to a space where it was um, sustainable on its own, that's when we kind of stepped back and was asked ourselves the questions like, what else do we want to do in life? And and that's when we started saying like, I want to, I want to go do yoga teacher training. He wants to go, you know, do power paragliding. Um, and so- well, Wasn't he the face of the show? Yeah. For a so long time when he actually stepped away before he died- um, and we had it running with different hosts at the time of his passing. And so oh. we had made this decision, like, now we want to focus on being with our kids, um, having experiences, doing trips, living the gospel, like, you know, let's retire ourselves in a way that we're not doing that grind. And while our kids are little, let's spend this time with them. Let's homeschool them. You know, let's teach them the principles we want them to be raised with and just really be involved in our family. And, you know, family was always the priority for us. And it was always like family is the most important thing. And everything we do is for the family. All this work that we're doing is for our family. All of this that we're establishing is for our family so that one day we can enjoy it. Hmm. Okay. Wow. And so yeah. you you start looking at, you were saying, other pursuits mm -hmm. and ways to get fulfilled. Yeah. And so at, at that point, and this is around 2018, we start, you know, exploring other things that, you know, piqued our interest. And we, we just started like living really what it felt like for the first time, not just working and raising kids and going to church. And so I think both of us really started to explore what do we really actually want out of life? What do we want to do? Who do we want to become? Um, like, how do we want to live our lives? And, and that's when like new questions started coming up. So between him and I, you know, we were still really united, but we both had different things we wanted to do. And now we didn't have this, you know, united mission and purpose to grow this business anymore. And so we were both kind of going outside of that, exploring it. Um, for me, one of the things I started to question was, you know, like, how, how does this religion play a role in my life and how can I really integrate it in the highest and best way? 
um, for him, he was like, I want to go do ex- extreme things. I want to like, I, I just want to have fun. Um, and so we both kind of like respectively went on those paths uh, separately. I mean, we were still together. We still had our family. We still did a lot of things, but we started spending a lot less time with each other. Um, and we just started getting interested in different things. And, you know, his things, I wasn't super interested in. I didn't want to power paraglide. Cause like that just looked really scary to me. <laughs> and I was like, you have to learn a lot. And, you know, you're a pilot, you already know all these, mm. you know, concepts around air and flight. And it's just so such an overwhelming learning curve to me. And, you know, like if I do one thing wrong, I'm going to crash and get hurt and I don't want to do that. (laughs) So, you know, and for me, I was like, well, I want to do yoga and I want to really connect to my spiritual side. And, you know, like I just, I just want to create this being within myself. That's like such a powerful, you know, spiritual space. And like, Mm -hmm. I want to be able to heal the world with my touch. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I just, and he's like, okay, that's weird. But you know, like if you're into it, go for it, you know, like I'll support you. So we, so we had very polar opposite, different interests that we wanted to start pursuing. And so he, so he went and got his power paragliding training. Um, this was in November of 2018. Once he came back from that, we were living in Salt Lake Valley at the time. And he was like, I don't want to live in Salt Lake Valley anymore. I want to be in a space where we can, I can go power paragliding all year long, like year round. So I'm done with the snow. He's from Canada. He's like, I've shoveled enough snow for my whole lifetime. I'm done. So um, he went out to St. George and was looking for a place. And we had talked several times about getting a place out there. Uh, but now he had a purpose to do it. So before I just wanted it because I thought it was a nice area. You know, Now it's like, oh, I can go power paragliding. And so I want to be out there. So he found this perfect house for him to do his power paragliding. And and we had talked about actually like moving down there full time. And so we wanted to build a house and all these things. But then we decided like, before we build a house in a place we've never lived, how about we just like buy something that's in a nice area, live in it for a couple of years and just see how we like living down there. And he was like, oh, that's such a great idea. Cause then we don't have to commit and we, you know, don't have to make such an investment and all these other things. And so like, as soon as he gets an idea, he just runs with it. So he went right down there, found a house, calls me up. He's like, Hey, I found this house. I'm going to buy it. And I'm like, well, aren't you going to show it to me first? You know? And he's like, yeah, I want you to come down. But anyway, so we bought the house, you know, it it was a really nice house. It was a, a good area. And, and he's like, I can't be here anymore. We were running our business out of our house in Salt Lake Valley at the time. He's like, I just need to go. And I'm like, okay, like, what does that mean? And he's like, I just like, I want you to come with me, but if you can't, I'm going anyway. And I was like, okay. So what we decided to do is I decided to stay in the house in Salt Lake Valley for a few more months. Uh, my second grader at the time was just doing super well in school and he'd never done well in school. He, he, he'd always struggled. So I didn't want to pull him out yet. My, our oldest was really struggling in school. And so he decided, well, I'll pull him out and I'll take him to St. George with me and I'll homeschool him and you can stay here with the other three and, you know, and then we'll, you know, meet back up when the time works out. So that's, that's kind of what our plan was. And this is interesting. So we weren't separated at all. We were just living in different places, planning to get back together in a little while, but this was really interesting because people were like, wait, Grant lives there and you live here. Like, are you guys getting divorced? Is there something going on? You know, it was all these, like, we, we just got so many odd looks and questions from everybody around us because like, if you're married, you live together, like that's what you do. And for us, we were not necessarily in a bad spot, but we were exploring different things and just kind of wanted some space and we had the opportunity to do it. And so we did. And it was really nice. And during that time, I kind of had some space to really like ask myself those questions in life. Like, what am I doing with my life and where am I at? And, you know, like, and being away from my spouse, my time was spent differently. And, and so it really kind of opened up, like, what do I really want out of life? And I was able to orchestrate life with my three little ones really well. And I had this wonderful routine to the point where I was like, I really love living here. I don't know if I want to move out there. But then I was like, you know, I can feel the distance that's being created between us and this is not healthy for our marriage. So I'm going to, I'm going to go move out there. And so I did end up finally pulling my second grader out and we all moved down there. And, and it, and that was a hard adjustment because it felt like 
I, I felt like going into this house that he'd picked for his reason to go par power paragliding, like I, I, it didn't feel like my home and it didn't feel like my space. And we had a hard time integrating back. And so that brought up a lot of issues, like just within our marriage and our relationship, like where are we going with this? And like, what is our marriage and what does it mean to us? And like, where are we really at? And, and this is like, we had never had any like space to ask these questions because everything was always just going so well. And we were, you know, doing things and following our routine and everything was working out great. And as soon as we kind of stepped away from that, it was like, mm, actually, is this working? Um, and that's not to say is our marriage working, but just like every aspect of our life, parenthood, church, mm -hmm. each other, ourselves individually. And it's like, it all just kind of came crashing down on us when we had the space yeah. to kind of step away from what we'd been doing as a grind for 18 hours a day for 10 years. So... In, I don't know how much you do or don't want to talk about this. In your outline, you mentioned that he had some rough stuff that mm -hmm. he experienced growing up. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> that probably affected, you know, your marriage mm -hmm. and your intimacy in various mm -hmm. ways. And there's all sorts of types of intimacy. Yeah. And that that even maybe came to a head the, the last couple of years of your marriage? Yeah, I'm, I'm it, yeah, speaking very it did. vaguely because I want to let you decide what yeah. you want to disclose. Um, so he, so he had grown up in a, out of the, out of the United States in Canada. And it, it, it was an interesting dynamic there. He had been very bullied as a kid. Um, the dynamics in his family were difficult when he was a baby. Um, and you know, there were some really hard things that happened to him as he was really young. And then, um, he had had some abuse happen uh, sexually with like neighbors and things like that throughout his like younger years. And then um, through adolescence, like this bullying, like really got heavy with him and mm. kids would just go out of their way every day to call him a loser. And he just had no self-confidence at all. And his mission kind of brought him out of that um, and gave him really the confidence to like do the things that he could do because he was given this outline, like you follow this precisely, which he did, and then you get this outcome. So he would follow this precisely. And, and that kind of went from the other extreme of like, he was like this rejected kid to this like kid that could do everything. And so he kind of felt like from childhood to mission, he had processed all of that trauma that kind of like came from that experience. And and this is where what I didn't realize is, you know, that that hadn't happened. He hadn't processed through it. And, you know, I'm just thinking as a good wife, you support your husband through anything, you know, and nothing, nothing bad was happening in our marriage. Like there wasn't abuse. He wasn't an alcoholic, you know, he wasn't cheating or I wasn't cheating, you know, like on the surface, it seemed like everything was really great. What I didn't see is his compulsive need for something. And during the 10 years we were working together, it was the building of the business and the validation of the comments and the videos and everything that was coming. And, and we were getting it at, at such a great, incredible rate that there was nothing other than we are the most successful and this is all working. So once that kind of went away, this validation left. And then it was like, he, he continued to need validation. <coughs> and so... So he had, he, he had a compulsive behavior, a, yes. a compulsive personality or something? Yeah, but because it wasn't drugs or alcohol or sex, you know, it was like, oh, he's perfectly fine. What I didn't realize is it was one thing after another after another. So when we first got married, he got really into skydiving. And I was like, oh, this is so great. This is cool. And then, you know, there was um, this kiting phase that he went through. He got in this kite and all he wanted to do was kite, you know, and then we started our business and then it was 100% in the business. And I was like, see, this is such a great quality he has. He can just really hyper-focus on things and get stuff done. Um, and because like this is producing income and it's supporting our family, there is nothing but positivity to be said around, you know, this compulsiveness, which I didn't see it as that at the time. And then when he took up power paragliding, it was just the same thing. It was like he lived, ate, breathed, died, you know, power paragliding. It's like all he wanted to do every waking moment. And, you know, to me at the time, I was kind of processing it as like, well, you know, he's worked really hard and this is the next thing and it brings him a lot of joy. What I didn't see was the compulsivity and addictive nature of it. Like the addictive nature of I need something that I'm not getting because I don't have it. And 
you know, that to me relates to when, especially as a child, you have a need that's not being met. It's like, unless you really go through and have that filled for you, that, that need met and that, that place in you, that's kind of, um, hollow healed, it's always there. I didn't know enough about psychology to really see that or understand that or understand like why he constantly needed to have something where it was like extreme to get, you know, a reaction from people. And it was because like the extreme reaction provided validation that he's better than like the average person. And so this was kind of like an overarching theme in our marriage that we're above like what normal couples do. Like we, we dated better than everybody else. We, you know, we had this, um, courtship that was more intense and we addressed all these issues and, you know, um, then we got married and like, we planned our family in this way, very intentionally so that we could do it better than everybody else. And, and I think like for me, that also came from this place of like, well, I am more special than most people. So I'm going to do things that are more special than most people. And he certainly had that mentality of like Superman, like the Superman complex, you know, I'm so capable of doing things that other people can't, that I am above like what's normal. Like I can perform better. I can do b bigger and better things. And, you know, I'm more immune to like the consequences of those things. And so this is what he believed about himself. I trusted him completely. So I believed that about him. You know, we would talk about para power paragliding and I would say that, you know, there's nobody more qualified to be up in the air than him. He's a pilot. He's been kiting, skydiving. He's got every single aspect of how to be successful and safe in this down. Like he's got it you know, and so I just never worried about him in that way because I was like, well, if something were to happen, he'd know right what to do. So he'd never get hurt because, you know, we've preeminently planned for that and we're special, <laughs> you know, mm. so, so that's not going to affect us. And we just both believed that, I think. And I, I mean, from the first time I saw him take off and he's a thousand feet up in the air and I'm like, whoa, that's really high, you know, and like if anything happens and you fall a thousand feet out of the sky, you are dead. <laughs> But I saw that and I was like, wow, that's really high. That's so amazing. Never once was I like, oh, like you could die doing this. It just didn't cross my mind that that would ever be an outcome mm -hmm. for not, yeah. not even just in the sport, in the sport of power paragliding, but in our, like he's in our marriage, like he's 38, you know, people don't die at 38. We got married in the temple. We plan to have a family. We plan to raise our kids together. This is our plan. We're following our plan. There's nothing outside of that that's going to affect the main things. Like, yeah, we've had speed bumps, but here's some more evidence for why you're so special. You've been able to get over those speed bumps and get right back on track. Mm -hmm. Before we talk about his death, um, <clears throat> you mentioned, and I don't, again, I don't know how much you want to talk about this, but you mentioned maybe a lot of sexual shame or torment that he experienced. And maybe you'll say this was his story to tell or not. Yeah. And then you mentioned how some body image things and yeah. then maybe the last couple of years of your marriage, uh, it all kind of coming to a head in terms of your intimacy. Is that an important part of his story or not really? I mean, it's, it's an important part of who I am because like now as I've been able to let go of those things that I didn't even know were issues at the time, because they were part of what like I thought reality was and then like being removed from that. So, so back to your question, like one of the things that I thought was super interesting is he grew up in like more of this very like prudish culture of, you know, like n don't talk about sex. Don't look at, you know, like any, like if you're getting dressed, cover up all the time. Like it's just like extreme prudishness. And, um, so he was very, very curious. He's always been very curious. And so, you know, he wanted to see, well, like, why can't I see what naked people look like? And so, you know, a, a young boy that leads to magazines and, you know, like, where can you find pictures of that to figure it out? And, you know, that was something that was really exciting to him. And, and so like, again, like the addictive nature of his personality was kind of like, I need to find out. And so I will be on a mission to find that out. And it was one of those things where, you know, you can't talk about it in any aspect. And, you know, growing up in the church, 
if you have a problem with porn or masturbation or or if you engage in any of those, not even have a problem, don't tell anybody. And that's kind of how that was portrayed for him. And, you know, it is his story to tell. At the same time, he's not here to tell it. And I'm what's left. And what I want to take from that is not like the negative aspects or, you know, the embarrassing parts or any of that, but like, this is the reality of what happened and also how it affected me in our marriage because of what actually happened. Yeah, that's fair. And so, you know, like the effect of that on me was that, you know, porn was an issue, but it wasn't a big deal. Uh, that's how we looked at it. It's like, oh yeah, well, sometimes, you know, you see porn, but like everybody does it and you just don't talk about it. And I, and to me, I'm like, well, you know, like we're in the church and the church says that's a sin. So shouldn't you confess it to the bishop? And it's like, no, it's just, you know, like it's not very often, but what that started to breed around sexuality was an inauthenticity around honesty in sexuality. And so then even though we're a married couple, And, you know, we had disclosed everything, you know, he said, yeah, I've looked at porn and, um, you know, like it's part of my childhood. It's part of my experience. But in my mind, I interpreted that. But after we get married, you won't need to look at porn anymore because we'll be married. And so then we can be intimate and it's allowed. And that's also not the reality of how things work. You know, you can have a wonderful, great, amazing, beautiful, intimate life and, you can still go outside of that in a personal way that your partner doesn't know about it. And then it creates that disconnection and disassociation from each other. And the problem with that is when you can't talk about it. So if I can't talk about, you know, like, well, are you looking at porn? Is it my business? Is it not my business? You know, we're partners. And if we can't even establish those ground rules, then it just becomes a taboo. And so once you have a taboo in a marriage that creates distance, even if it's just one thing. And, you know, like we could still talk about those things, but for me personally, I felt so much shame around talking about any of those things that I didn't feel comfortable bringing it up in a way that I felt empowered to have a conversation around it because it was just like so uncomfortable for me. And so, you know, I I remember thinking, how do I do this? And I don't know. So I'm just not going to do it. So do it meaning like just have a conversation about it or, you know, Mm -hmm. like ask, like, is this something that's still part of your life? And, you know, like we were still open enough that I knew in like what aspects it was still playing a part. But even in those aspects, you know, I would say, well, you know, instead of you taking care of yourself, well, like, why don't you come talk to me? And like, we can see if it would be a good time for us to be together, you know, And then like, if, if I want to be intimate and you're not in the mood because you know, you're, you've already like taken care of yourself, then it's like, well, like that affects our intimacy. And so, but for him, it was like this, um, I don't want to go outside of myself and ask because I'm not sure how it's going to be responded to. Because as a child, I was criticized for asking for what I need and I was made fun of. And, you know, it's not that I wasn't a safe person to, for him to ask. It was that he had these issues within himself. And so he made decisions that affected our marriage, that affected our intimacy, that we couldn't talk about because of the healing that he hadn't done based on the culture that shamed all of this, you know, everything. So in every aspect of our marriage, we had a great relationship and there was this one part that was kind of like, we don't talk about it. We just navigate around it. And it all came from shame and addiction and not feeling safe to talk about things that are not all of the good stuff. Hmm. So we could still have hard conversations, just not about one topic, you know, and it's, it was around sexuality. We could talk about our sexuality with each other, but like the personal sexuality and like that, aspect of it, it wasn't something that either of us could do within our marriage. And you mentioned in your outline that the last couple of years of your, your marriage, yeah, you, were you kind of estranged that way a little bit? Or? Yeah. Yeah. What was interesting is, um, and I, like, I, I couldn't figure this out, but our, our intimacy kind of just tapered off. And I was like, well, you know, you like your sexual intimacy. Yeah. Sexual intimacy. Yeah. And uh, like, you know, we used to have a really 
great sexual life. And now it's like, we're not sleeping together anymore. He's sleeping with the kids or I'm sleeping with the kids. And there's so far that can go before it's like, well, actually like you're not. And the whole time we were living apart, you know, like I went and visited him a couple of times and we just never like came together intimately. So it was like six months that was going by. And I was like, like, asking my friends, like, is this normal? Like, do other people do this? And it's like, oh yeah, it's normal. Like when you, when you've been in a marriage so long, like sometimes you have phases where you, uh, are more intimate sexually and, uh, and then you have time that goes by where it's not. And, you know, I'm hearing from other couples like, oh yeah, we, we only have sex a, a few times a year. And I'm like, what? Like, so I'm, I'm starting to ask and like starting to get feedback. Cause I'm like, I don't know if this is normal. And one of the things that I felt was happening at that time um, well, first of all, I was like, I wonder if his testosterone is low. So it could be a hormonal thing, you know, like that phase in your life. But it, it was, it was this transition that we had gone through. And this was like a new rejection for me because he, I, I didn't feel like he wanted me or needed me in the same ways that he had before. Like when we were working together, it's like we had this mission to accomplish. And now he, he wanted his paragliding and he wanted to like really focus mm -hmm. on the kids. And I was like, but what about me? And he's like, well, yeah, I mean, like, what are you doing? You know? And it's like, wait, this whole time I thought we were doing this together. And now I'm questioning, are we doing this together? Because, you know, he doesn't like my yoga and, and this is not to be critical of him, but it's like, he's not into this thing that I'm into, but I need to be super into this thing he's into. And it's like, well, uh, you know, like I love you and I support that for you, but like, what does that mean? Like, do I need to do it with you? Do I need to be there every time you take off and land? Do I need to, you know, like how, how do I show up and support you for this? Because, you know, he became, and then this was the other aspect coming out of the business and into like this family culture that we had created. Like we'd neglected a lot of like the systems within our family. We're just getting by day to day. So, you know, he takes his focus from building the business to the family. And it's like, oh, here's all the things you're doing wrong in the family. And I'm like, wait, like this has been working for 10 years. I'm open to changing it, but like there has to be like some integration. It's not like you come in here and you're an expert and you change everything, you know? And so we were struggling uh, in that way of like kind of butting heads on like, okay, how do we want to run the family? Well, I want to run it this way and I want to run it this way. <laughs> and so like we were, tr we were navigating how to figure that out. And, and it was rough because we'd never, we'd never really like had any kind of fight, like the whole decade, our first whole decade. And it's not that we hadn't disagreed. It's that we were always able to just talk through it. But I think again, it's like this there's so many deeper issues that we either weren't aware of or didn't know how to talk about or didn't know how to address. And so we couldn't get through them. So this is like the second, you know, decade of a marriage where I think you start really addressing those things, even though we had this amazing foundation um, beca because of this trauma. And I didn't understand like how trauma really affects someone that's actually been abused. I, I didn't see the signs and I didn't know how he was interacting. He was he was trying to find satisfaction and fulfillment and uh, value in life by doing things, which I understood that. And at the same time, um, so one, one of the examples is he, he was very body conscious. And for a man, he was always saying like, oh, you know, like I'm too fat or I've got this belly and, you know, I'm looking at him and I'm like, well, I'm really attracted to you. I think you're a really handsome guy. And he's like, no, I've got this, you know, extra five or 10 pounds. And and I'm looking at my friends, you know, and the the men are complaining about how their wives say that, you know, and, and I'm looking at him, I'm like, oh man, I just love my body. And he's like, oh, I, I think my body's fat. And I'm like, we're kind of switched in that role. Like, that's kind of interesting. Why is that happening? And I realized like he had placed value on how he looks because of, you know, some of the sexual trauma that happened and how taboo the body was. And so he became a little bit over conceptualized about body image. And one of the interesting things about that is once I realized, like I could say all day long, like you're so handsome, you look so, you know, like you're in great shape. I mean, an extra five pounds, you look fine. Like you look fine. Like you're more in shape than most of the guys your age, you know, like how can you be so obsessed over this? And then I realized it's because he doesn't believe it himself. Like he doesn't believe that he looks good. He believes that he's five pounds overweight and until that's gone, he's not valuable. And so then I realized I can't fix that for him and I can't tell him 
you look great because he doesn't believe that. So then not only am I telling him something he doesn't believe, I'm lying to him because he doesn't believe what I'm telling him. And so then that became another like source of disassociation because I'm just telling him what he wants to hear. In reality, I'm telling him how I actually feel, but that's not how he's hearing it. And so because I didn't realize that, I'm like just trying and trying to fix the problem. The problem being how he sees himself or, you know, how we communicate over this or that. And, and then, you know, like I can't fix what he thinks. And that's when I realized, oh my gosh, like I've been trying to please him this whole marriage that we've had. And one of the books that I read that kind of like really brought this out was The Four Agreements uh, by, I can't remember the author, but it's called The Four Agreements. Ruiz? Yeah, mm-hmm. Ruiz. Yeah, Don Miguel Ruiz. Ruiz yeah. And I just realized, like, again, I've fallen into this trap of doing everything outside of myself because that's what I feel like is expected. That's what I feel like this plan has been for me. That's what I feel like is what you know, like there's nothing outside of this that I should be doing when really it's like myself that I should be asking these questions to like, how do I want to interact with my husband? Is it my job to make him feel good about himself? Is it my job to, you know, support him in everything he does and give up the things I want to do? And it's not that that was what we did in our marriage, but those things would happen. And because I didn't realize it, it put us on this path. So when we started asking ourselves, you know, what do I want to do in our life? Uh, you know, after we kind of put the business as a secondary priority, it's like all these questions come up that we didn't have the capacity to answer because there had been so many things that we just didn't know how to address. And, you know, like I started to feel like, oh, this is how men and women like really start to not be able to understand each other in communication because everything had been so great up to that point. And I was like, I wonder if this is like how couples fight most of the time, you know, (laughs) like these issues that, you know, I hear couples have these unbelievable fights. And at that point, we like neither of us really liked conflict. And so we would always just solve problems really peaceably. But I think we left out really important, critical key points that we were not allowed to talk about, like taboos. Mm -hmm. Like, can I talk about the sexual abuse you had? And is that related to how you feel about your body? Like, uh, I don't know. Or why we're not having sex now. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. And is that because, you know, you're more concerned about taking care of, you know, what you need without bothering me because you see me as something outside of yourself? Like, are we really like a marriage companionship or am I just an accessory? Are you just an accessory for me? Because we were both very independent people and we would always joke about how we didn't um, want to be, let's see, we would always say we didn't need to be with each other. I don't need you. You know, I want you. I Mm -hmm. want to be with you. I want to love you, but I don't need to love you. I don't need to be with you. If you were to go away, like I'd be just fine. You Mm -hmm. know, like, of course I'd miss you and all these things, but you know, we, we always felt like pretty empowered around being like interdependent versus codependent and, um, maybe to an extreme where we didn't understand like, uh, like really like integrating ourselves together. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like towards those last couple of years, you started to grow apart. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Well, maybe is it time to talk about his passing? Yeah. Do you want to talk about that next? Yeah, we can go there. Okay. Yeah. So the actual day that it happened, I had just come back from a yoga retreat and to set it up, I'd been gone for seven days and he'd been with the kids for seven days without me. And he's like, Oh man, I haven't been able to do the things I want to do. And like this, this has been like so much and I need to take a break. So he'd gone power paragliding that morning and in, in St. George. Yeah. In St. George. Yeah. Now. So okay. we were all living together now. And in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, like this has been the last, you know, like 12 years of my life, (laughs) like not just a week. And now you need to go like take a break and go power paragliding, but I get it. Like I support that. And so, um, you know, he went that morning, came home. It was great. So he would usually go once a day, but because he was feeling neglected, like he hadn't been able to go as much as he wanted, he wanted to go again that night. And so, and I had just been traveling, I had a headache and I was kind of feeling like needy and I, I didn't want to tell him not to go, but I didn't, I really didn't want him to go. And I had never felt that way before. So 
what was interesting is that whole day we were just like together. Like it was really low key. We were just kind of like in and out of each other's space, like in the house all day. And, you know, normally we would go out and we would do things. And, but today we were just home and we were just like crossing paths all day. And it was really kind of sweet. And I remember, um, I was laying down and like just taking a little, a little nap and, you know, he came down and laid next to me and, and like, you know, we were like hugging each other and kind of spooning. And I was just like, Oh, this is just so nice. Like I could just do this forever, you know, and feeling like for some reason, this is not like, this is just a moment and this is going to be over and like, enjoy this. And it, it was just like this weird, like, longing feeling for something that was gone, that was right there, that was happening. And I, I couldn't quite like comprehend what that was. And then just like an hour later, I, I had said to him, I was like, Hey, remember how your GPS tracker is connected to your phone. And like, if anything ever were to happen to you when you're out paragliding, I don't remember how to access your location on that GPS tracker. So can you just remind me how to find you if, you know, if anything were to happen? So, you know, he pulled up his phone, showed me like, oh yeah, here's the tracker. Here's the app. Here's how you locate it. Here's how you find the location. Here's how you're fresh. So, you, you know, as the location's moving or whatever, I was like, okay, great. Thanks so much. So, um, you know, like I, I asked that question that day, like what was on my mind? Like, why did I ask him that? And I, I kind of felt like I was guided or led. And, you know, like that was a question I was supposed to ask. And then, and then in my mind, like, well, if, if I knew that I was supposed to ask that, you know, like what was going to happen and how did, if, if I was supposed to ask that, then obviously like whatever caused me to ask that would have known that, you know, something was going to happen. And right. like, why, why, why couldn't, that? why couldn't they have prevented that from happening instead of like prompted me to ask this question? You know, right. this was like kind of one of the things yeah. that as I'm looking back, I'm like, hmm. and I'm really grateful that I asked, you know, because that's how we found his body. Hmm. But, um, so that, so that night we had done our little family routine. We did scriptures, we did prayer and I had kind of got, gotten him on a, um, I, I had come up with this whole plan to get him to do scriptures and prayer with the kids. I was like, okay, if we read the Book of Mormon all together as a family, we can go to Disneyland. So that was our goal. And we we had actually, we had gotten into a good routine doing that. We had just finished the Book of Mormon, I think. And so anyway, we were in this good routine. We'd done our scriptures and prayer. You know, we talked to the kids about their day and, and you know, we'd talk to each other and, and then, you know, we kissed all the kids and about to get them ready for bed. And then he said, Hey, can the two older boys stay up tonight so that I can put them to bed? I just want to give them this experience of playing some video games tonight. I just really want to give that to him. And the way he said it was so weird. I was like, you want to give them playing video games tonight? Like, okay. Like, I guess if that's really important to you. So I put the two little kids to bed um, we kissed goodbye. He walked out the door and, you know, that was the last time I saw him. So he had said, I will be home at nine 30. And he was always pretty much on time. And I'm sitting in my bed. I've got one of the older kids next to me playing on his game. And, you know, I'm looking at the clock and I just feel like immediately at nine 30, I just looked at the clock. I'm like, it's nine 30. Now, nothing out of the ordinary had happened yet, but in that moment, I said, I wish Grant were here so he could see how cute Riley and I look in the bed because I'm reading a book and Riley's right next to me and he's just going to be so excited when he comes home and sees us, you know, like cuddling in the bed and we're together and I'm letting him play this video game and, you know, it's just, he's just going to love walking into this. And I look at the clock and it's 930 and immediately I felt, I was like, Grant. And like, I was like, are you here? Like, it just felt like immediately when I said, I want Grant to be here and see this, like he was there. I couldn't see him, but I felt like he was there. And I was like, oh, that's really weird. Like, why would I feel like he's here? And it felt like this very overwhelming feeling of like when a person walks in the room and you know who it is without seeing it, but they're actually there. That's what it felt like. Like he was actually there. I just couldn't see him. And it was very, very distinct. It was like Grant standing in that corner. And I was like, no, he's not, you know, like in my logical brain, but in my heart, I was like, he's right there. That's weird. And then I went back to my book, you know, I was like, oh, he'll be here in a few minutes. And so, but I felt uneasy. And so that's when I 
checked my phone. It's 945. As soon as I checked my phone, I saw my neighbor calling and I was like, yeah, something's off because he's not home yet. He said he'd be home at 930. It's 945. And I just like got this panic feeling at 945. I pick up my phone and my neighbor's calling me right at this moment when I'm feeling panicked. So I answer the phone. He's like, hey, it's your neighbor across the street. I'm just like, is Grant okay? And I was like, uh, like, what do you mean? He's like, well, his truck is still at the park and his, you know, his flying paraphernalia is not on the back of it because it was always on the back of it. And, you know, it's just getting dark. And I just wanted to check in. I was like, well, no, I, you know, I haven't heard from him. And he, it's, he said he'd be home at nine 30. Sometimes he gets, you know, caught up in the park talking to people about the paragliding, but then he'll come straight home. So it's also not totally out of the ordinary for him to not be home at nine 45 if he were to get talking to somebody, but he should be home any minute, you know, so I'll call him. So I called and I called and I called and it just went straight to voicemail every single time. And I was like, what is going on? And I knew he wanted to fly in this area that didn't have reception. So I just figured, oh, he's out of reception. So then the neighbors called again and they're like, it's totally dark. He's not here. Um, you need to call the police. And I was like, what? Like, why would I call the police? He's He is not going to like that. He's going to be totally embarrassed if mm. the police found him and, mm. you know, he's just like run out of gas or something. He, I'm like, no, I need to go get him because he doesn't want to be embarrassed with everybody finding out some mistake that he made and that was stupid. So I get on the computer, I look up his location and I see he's like right on the border of Utah and Arizona. So we're in St. George, which is close to there, but it's an hour drive from where I'm at. And I'm like, why is he an hour away from where I'm mm -hmm. at? So in my mind, you know, I'm self-sufficient and I, you know, I do everything. I don't go outside myself to ask for help. I, I'm like, oh, well, I, I guess I need to get in the car and go pick him up. <laughs> you know, so I'm planning to get in the car. All my kids are at home. Two of them are awake and I'm planning to drive an hour to go pick up my husband. Cause I think he's run out of gas and, and this just, and like, I already knew something was off. And this is where I can already see my brain going into the space of like illogical thinking. So then my neighbors are kind of like, no, 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 no. You're not like, you don't, you're not going to get in your car. I was like, why not? <laughs> and they're like, well, we just need to call the police first. So finally, like, I'm just fighting myself on this. Like, I don't want to call the police. I don't want to make this a big deal. I don't want to embarrass him. I don't want to, you know, all these things I don't want to do. And then finally, it's just like something in me, in me is like, you have to call the police. So I, I'm like, okay, I'll just do it. And against everything that I wanted to do, called the police, submitted a missing persons report. And I'm like, he's only been gone an hour, you know, like you can't, they're, they're mm. not considered missing unless they've been gone so long. So they're not even going to listen. Like, I just didn't know how any of this worked. And I was just really nervous about like the whole process. So I called him. I looked up the GPS location, gave him the GPS location. I kept trying to call him, but I was like, well, he's out of service. That's why he's not answering. Looking back, if I would have been, so first of all, he had a, like a, an emergency thing on the GPS that he could have, you know, sent out if he was capable of doing that. He didn't do that. The other thing is his GPS location never moved once as soon as I found it. It was just stationary. And so, I mean, he's not a stationary person. In my mind, I'm just thinking, oh, he's just sitting there waiting for us. <laughs> so I'm already going into this space of like panic and like trying to figure out like how this logically could work because everything works out in the end. So what are the ways that this will work out even though something's off? So you know, some time goes by, like we're just waiting and waiting and waiting and like nothing's really happening. They're out looking for him. So then a dispatch finally calls me. It's like 1230 at night and they're like, okay, um, we're going to send a helicopter out to the location because it's pretty remote. There's not really roads to get out there. And, you know, we'll let you know. I'm like, okay, how long is the helicopter ride? They're like, oh, it's about 30 minutes. I'm like, okay, so once you pick him up, how long will it take to get back? She's like, oh, probably about an hour. So I'm thinking in my mind, okay, it'll be about an hour and a half before he gets home. <laughs> so like in my mind, I'm like a helicopter. And at this point I hadn't told anybody. So I finally send a message to his parents, his brothers, I didn't send a message to my family because I was like, I don't want to worry them. And my mom just loves to worry about things. And, you know, when he's home safe tomorrow, then I'll tell her about it. So I send a message to his family. I'm like, hey, look, nobody freak out. Like Grant hasn't come home tonight. Just send us some prayers because I want to make sure that, you know, like we find him. And I just wanted to make you aware that he's gone and we don't know where he is. So they start freaking out. And I'm like, why are you guys freaking out? Like, it's fine. Like he just is somewhere and we're going to find him and he'll come home. Like, it's fine. 
so then more time passes. We don't hear anything. We don't hear anything. And now it's like, so it's 1230 that I get this call from uh, the, the helicopter people. So I'm thinking, okay, in my mind, 1231, two. So he should be home by two. So then two comes and goes. And then three comes and goes. And I'm just like, what is going on here? So then I'm like, man, it's three o'clock in the morning. I'm so tired. Like, I'm not going to be able to function with the kids. Maybe I should just try and get some sleep. But I felt guilty because I didn't want him to come home and have everybody have the lights off. And we all just fell asleep and, you know, forgot about you. So I kept the lights on and I just kind of laid back and closed my eyes. And then 3.30, my doorbell rang. I run out there. I open the door. I see four guys. I'm like looking for Grant's face. You know, I'm like, oh, I don't see Grant out there, which if he was out there, why would he ring the doorbell? Right. (laughs) And it's police officers. And there was two people from the church there and they just said, can we come in? And I said, yeah. And then I'm thinking in my mind, when I see this in the movies, that's not good. (laughs) So I was like, did you find Grant? And they're like, yeah, we found Grant. And I was like, oh, good. And they're like, it's not good. And I was like, what does that mean? You know, like, uh, maybe we're going to go to the hospital. So then, you know, they're like, can we sit down? I'm like, oh, that's also not good. In the movies, when they tell the the wife to sit down, that usually means they're dead. <laughs> so I was like, oh, no. And the thing is, like, from the moment that 930 hit and he wasn't home, I already knew. Like, and I would not even look at that as a possibility until it was confirmed. But I knew everything was different. And I knew that I had been ignorant to the reality and I would not face the reality until it was confirmed. And so the moment it was confirmed was when the police officer walked in and he said, we found your husband, he's been in an accident and he did not survive. And my response to that was, I know. And he kind of looked at me like, uh, I don't think you understood what I said. We found your husband and he was in an accident and he didn't survive. He's deceased now. And I was like, yeah, I know. And everybody just kind of looked at me like, how do you know that? And and then in my mind, I was like, well, they can't tie me. I wasn't even there when he died. So it's, I didn't do anything. That's not how I know. I just know. And then, you know, they're like, can you sit down? Let's ask some questions. And I was like, yeah, okay, sure. And they're all just looking at me with this face of like, just complete horror. And, and I was like, I, like the way you guys are looking at me is really uncomfortable because it's like, you're waiting for me to react and, and so then they start offering, like, my wife can come over and sit with you. I'm like, I don't want to sit with some stranger that I don't know. Like, I want to be alone. I want to go, like, just look at my kids sleeping. Like, I have no interest in talking to anybody that's, you know, your wife or the bishop's wife or anybody, you know. And so then I, I, I just, like, kind of got through the questions and they didn't want to leave. And I was like, you guys, please leave. Like, I need you to get out of my house. And they were super hesitant because I, I don't think they knew like if I understood or, you know, if, or if you were suicide risk. Yeah, exactly. Or if you were, gonna, or, if yeah. you were emotionally yeah. stable for your kids. Exactly. Right? And, and yeah. I could definitely see that there was like, uh, I don't think she should be left alone. And I was like, get out of my house. <laughs> so anyway, I just, so then I called his parents and I told them they were the first people that I told And then I just went back up to my bed where I had been. Well, actually, I went up to the bunk room where all my kids were sleeping and I just laid down next to him. And I was just like, what? Like, what do I do? Like, should I wake him up? And then I was like, no, number one rule in parenting is never wake up a sleeping child. And so I just looked at him and I was like, I don't know how I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you when you wake up. Can we just all not wake up? Because if we don't, then we don't have to. Or maybe this is a dream. Maybe if I go to sleep and then I wake up, it won't be real, you know? So then my kids got up and I just kind of stared at them and I took them outside and I jumped on the tramp with them and I'm like jumping up and down in this like comatose state, you know, like thinking like, oh yeah, everything's normal. It's just fine. And in my mind, I'm like, what am I going to do? Like, what do I even do? I just, you know, and there's no textbook on this. Like, how do you tell your kids their dad's dead? How do you like go through your days now? Like, I just, I was like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I was just at a complete loss. The first time in my life, I was just like, I have no idea about anything. I'm not sure I even know how to keep breathing. Mm. Hmm. So how did you, like, thank you for telling us that's (laughs) so hard. I mean, I, it sounds like, I'm relating to one thing that I think I might be hearing. Mm -hmm. I'm, 
I don't always have the emotional reaction to things that <laughs> people sometimes prefer, want, or expect yeah. from me. Yeah. Specifically, I, I it's rare. It's rare that I cry. Mm-hmm. In fact, my sister died of colon cancer, and I know I've never cried about it. Yeah. Even though I loved my sister. Yeah. And I feel things. It's mm-hmm. just that's not the way I react, and I never did. And I don't know whether that just means I didn't process it or, or um, that I. I just accepted it. I don't mm-hmm. know. But yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'm just I'm relating to the idea that you were watching them watch you, yeah. expecting a certain type of reaction, mm-hmm. and that isn't how you're wired, or is it yeah. what you were feeling, or something? Yeah. So how do you, how would you describe what you were feeling? I think that I was feeling this sense of okay, you're giving me this information. I don't know what to do with it yet. So I'm just going to kind of put it right here for a minute and like, I'll start processing it when I'm ready, but it doesn't mean anything yet. Like in my mind, logically, I know it means like my husband's dead. The first thing I thought was (laughs) my kids don't have a dad anymore. Like what? Like, that's why I married a good Mormon guy that's family centered so that I would have children that would grow up with a father. The second thought I had was, who am I going to have sex with now? (laughs) And the third thought I had was my life is going to change forever, but like, how? I don't, like, I don't comprehend that. So, I mean, those are, uh, in my opinion, kind of three really odd thoughts to have. And there was no emotion with them because, you know, I, I feel things for sure. And I didn't cry for weeks I mean, I think I tried to cry a few times and it felt so forced that I was like, this is really dumb. Um, but it's just like, you know, we all process emotions in different ways. And it's not that I didn't feel something. It's just that I had to take the information and look at it for what it was. And I couldn't react to the information. I just needed to know, like, just what to do next. Like, just take another breath, <laughs> you know, because it was so big And I knew that this would impact me. But in that moment, there had been nights that we'd been apart. Like, so my life had not changed one bit yet in reality. Like I was still in my house. I still had my kids. My husband was away just because he wasn't going to come back. This was not outside the realm of normal for me yet. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how I was interpreting all of this. I think, you know, as you're describing yourself and just how, you know, uh, yeah, mind altering, earth shattering. This is mm-hmm. in so many ways. It reminds me of a freeze yeah. response, honestly. And and mm. I think it's really important in traumatic situations, in times of like mental and emotional survival, to just say we don't choose how we cope with what we're given. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. it's some. It's a reaction. Yeah. Um, and so that that's what I feel from mm-hmm. kind of what you're mm-hmm. w- what you're saying. We don't choose our thoughts either. Yeah. In those in those times. And um, anyway, I just feel, you know, I'm feeling mm-hmm. all the feels for those yeah. moments. Thank you for going there mm-hmm. and being willing to to describe it a bit. And I also feel, um, you know, in an indirect way, um, you know. There are so many ways that you're feeling this situation. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, you have your partner. But mm-hmm. there's also this large parent thing that in my moments, oftentimes of times of trauma or where a reality flip happens in a really – in a moment mm-hmm. is you – it's like a sharpened focus in a way where you have this realization of like I'm about to change their life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like we're in the pre, but we're one step away yeah. from kind of it or, all yeah. um, changing for them. And I'm I'm hearing that from you too. Yeah. And it's like we're in the last moment that this will ever be a semblance of reality. And how can I hold on to it and just keep it a little bit longer? Yeah. Because I know I can't. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And the freeze response, I've never really thought of it that way, but I think that that's insightful as far as like how I responded to that was, you know, just everything stops. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, that's devastating. I, I also, the, the the second reaction you had, who am I going to have sex with, was interesting because you guys weren't really being well, sexually intimate. It, well, it was because he was the only person I'd ever been with right. and I was married to him and yeah. now I'm not married anymore. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah. so it was like, this is a part of my life, regardless of like the phases that we've been through. And like, this is a part of my life I'm used to. So now what am I supposed right. to do? Because yeah. like- you're only supposed to have sex with your married partner. Mm -hmm. That's the opposite sex of you. <laughs> yeah. And that'll, that'll come into play in part two. Yeah, um, exactly. But then the other thought I didn't hear you say was, um, what about our livelihood? So I guess maybe financially you were fine or. Yeah. Or I, yeah. I didn't, yeah. I didn't think about that at all. I just thought my kids don't have a dad. I don't have an intimate partner anymore to share in physical intimacy with and everything else too. I mean, that was part of it. And everything in my life is going to change. Those are the three things mm -hmm. that just were really so present to mm -hmm. me in that moment where I knew everything that I had founded my life on would no longer be. Yeah. I mean, those questions are so, they're so interesting because on a level you have the parenting mm -hmm. part of your identity. You have your own identity with your partner mm -hmm. and what that means. And then you have this existential, the world as you know it. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah. 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 And that's exactly kind of the questions I went through because it's like, you know, m m the money is easy. You can make money doing anything, right? And well, like, some, some people can, not everyone can. Well, everyone is capable of it, but it's like, yes, like that's an easily solvable problem is where I'm coming from. But like, you can't replace a child's father. You can replace an income. You can't replace mm. a father. You can yeah. replace, you know, a home or you can go live somewhere else, but you can't replace a partner. You can get a new partner, but you can't, I mean, death is so final. There's nothing you can do to undo that. And that's the concept that I didn't really have any understanding of, but I knew that I would have to figure it out because in my world, when we hit a speed bump, you can undo it, go around it, figure it out and fix it and make something as good or better. But like, you know, like when a person dies, you can't undie them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Unless yeah. you're Jesus and then he can resurrect. True. Oh, true. I'm sorry, I'm if that happens. That. I mean, yeah. Like even that. I like I go through the intricacies of those stories and I'm like, mm, I don't know. But mm -hmm. yes, supposedly. You know, but even that. I mean, I mean that's a whole other Mormon stories podcast, right? <laughs> yeah. So, I guess I think I've decided I want to split this up into two parts cuz I think we're going to go a little bit over 4 hours and uh so what I want to do maybe for this part 1, this will be kind of when when your Mormon husband dies kind of the episode mm -hmm. and then part two will be like the questioning rebuilding and the... rebuilding a life after yeah. your husband dies okay. it, as a Mormon widow mom mm -hmm. widow right yeah I don't know the words but I guess I, I I would like to end this episode by talking about everything up to his funeral that that you still want to share in terms of theology religion how the church mm -hmm. dealt with it mm -hmm. just anything dealing with the Mormon or the really important personal aspects of his death in, in your story. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. makes sense. So when, you know, I found out about this and I told his parents and I am processing it and, you know, I'm like, okay, how do I reach out? Like, who do I call? What do I do? Who do I talk to? I just, I didn't, I didn't know. I was like, I don't even know who to call. So then I thought, okay, I'll call my parents. So I called my mom um, told her she just couldn't believe it. I mean, she just started crying immediately, you know, and I'm mm. sitting there on the phone thinking like, I'm not crying. Why are you crying? <laughs> you know, but again, like different reactions and she's, uh, she's just more emotionally connected in that way. And things touch her. Whereas, you know, I, I'm just like, I got to get this information out and figure it out. And she's like, well, do you want me to come up? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I just, so then I, I think that we had this conversation and she's like, well, I'm just going to come up. So she, you know, got in the car, started driving up. I didn't really know. It wasn't like present to that. And then I just went up and I like went into my kid's room, looked at them all. They're all dead asleep. And I'm just thinking like how, 
I, like, I feel so sorry for you guys that you're going to have to wake up to this. Like, this is not right. This shouldn't be happening. Like, how did this happen? And, and the other thing that started really coming up in my mind was how did this happen? Like, he is so mm -hmm. capable. Like, how could this have happened? How could this be possible? Like, what happened? So then I start thinking like, well, you know, he was, he was kind of in this territory where they're like really territorial. It's like over Colorado city, you know, and if you know anything about that culture, it's kind of like this. Well, yeah, we didn't ask what happened. How, if they don't. Yeah. Well, I died. didn't know yet. Yeah, yeah. So like, yeah. I'm like, what happened? That so makes sense to me. And I'm like, what if he was power paragliding and someone shot him? Because like mm. he wouldn't have like gotten in an accident. What if this is mal, like there's malpractice, malplay in here. And you know, like what if something, and I'm just like, now I'm like, wait, what happened? Cause I didn't know. And so I don't know if you want me to tell you what happened now or as I find out, but like I can it's up to you. go either way. Okay. So I'll, I'll just say what happened. Cause that's easier to put it into context without like all this time of not knowing, which yeah. that's what it was yeah. for me. And how that experience long, was how difficult. How long did you not know? Um, it was like a week and a half. Mm -hmm. It was a long time. And yeah. because it was an unattended death, mm -hmm. they took the body straight to Salt Lake. And so I didn't even see him for like seven days. Mm -hmm. And so I was still like watching the front door. Like it wasn't really him. He's going to walk through the door and then every day would go by and he didn't. And then I'm like, Oh, maybe it's real, you know? And so, um, and he had had a, um, GoPro. So he had filmed like the whole thing was on oh. film. And so I was like, where's the video? Where's the video? Where's the video? I, I need to know what happened. And so the police took the video. They watched it because it was an outward angle. You couldn't see him or really what happened, but you could kind of get a sense of it. And what we finally en ended up, you know, figuring out from the video and everything that happened is he was on these, um, these cliffs where they go up high, you know, and then they go flat and then there's some hills down this way. <laughs> So he was on these cliffs that go up really high, then came to a plateau and then went into this like hilly area. Well, when wind does that, what wind does is it goes like this, you know, it kind of eddies and spins around and then it kind of gets like flat over the flat part and then it'll drop down and then it'll eddy again. And so as he was along the edge of the high cliffs and then went into the plateau part, the wind was fine. It was when he kind of went into this um, like valley area and there was more distinction between the altitude of the, you know, sky to the ground. And it was more like, it, it was just a faster slope. It wasn't like the sheer edges of the cliffs, but it was flat. And then it was a slope. That's where there was different space in the air. And with the winds as high as they were, the winds were eddying through that. And as he flew into that, a wind eddy caught his parachute and just took his parachute down. So in the video, you see he's flying along, it's fine. And then all of a sudden it's this bam, like this something hits him and it was wind. And what was super interesting and this like still adds to the credibility that we both had in this belief of like nothing can happen. And if something does, he'll know exactly what to do. So it's six seconds from the time you see this, you know, like kind of gush of wind, you hear it and he's on the ground dead, six mm. seconds. And in that six seconds, he grabs his um, alternative parachute because he knows his parachute has been, and he deploys it. So he, like in like two seconds, he had got his reserve parachute out as he's spinning around, like because it because when the wind got his parachute, it took him down. So the wind is thrusting him to the ground. So it's faster than free falling and he's spinning. And as he's spinning, like all of these things are happening, all this input and he pulls his res reserve chute. And the only reason that didn't save him is because he was just low enough that it didn't deploy. Like the parachute didn't, um, like come out all the way. Like it was completely extended. It just wasn't deployed. And then, um, because he was at an accelerated fall, he was at a level where it maybe could have deployed, but because it was an accelerated fall. So he was just high enough that it it was fatal and he was just low enough that his parachute didn't deploy. And so it was just like the sweet spot of like 50 to 100 mm. feet. If he had been lower, he could have survived. If he had been higher, his reserve chute could have saved him, you know? And so it's like, gosh, like I I really trusted that if anything were to happen he would know what to do. And I was right. He did know what to do. And he was just in this like wrong spot mm -hmm. for every single aspect of training that we were capable of, mm -hmm. of, you know, expressing 
And it didn't work because of that one little factor. And it's like, uh, but there were other factors too. It's like that went that night, the wind was very high, you know, it was higher than he should have been flying in. It was later than he usually goes out. He was further than he usually goes. And so all these things start to stacking on top of each other. And then that's what creates this inability to get through something, you know, and you, you can't fight nature. Like you can't argue with nature and win. And, and this is where it's like, no, I think I can. So I'm going to try it. And then it doesn't work. And then in this case, death is the result. Mm. So. Mm. I'm so sorry. Yeah. So anyway, that's what happened. And, um, you know, then it was about like, I, then I had to start making all these decisions and, you know, like, where do you want the body sent and what do you want to do? And yeah. do you like, what kind of a casket do you want? And I'm like, these are like, these are decisions. Like we've just like barely talked about once in a while. We've never made decisions about this. Like yeah. I don't want to buy a casket and bury it. Like that seems so stupid. And then I'm starting to ask myself, like, what are these customs we have around death? Like, why do we do these cement boxes? And why do we spend all this money on these really nice wood boxes and then bury them? And like, this is all really weird to me. Like, this is just weird. Like, yeah. where do these customs come from about how we, and why do we fill them with all these chemicals? And like, why do we put makeup on them and make, they look horrible. Like, so I just started like going through this process of this. Mm-hmm. And also Mormonism, you're buried in your temple clothes. Yes. yes which you is are. your baker cap and your mm-hmm. white robe and your, ro- yep. you know, the green apron yep. and yep. all that. Right? Yeah. So we, so the, the funeral home that we went through there, like, well, do you want us to get all new temple clothes for him? And I was like, yeah, I decided I was like, well, like I, okay, what do I do with his body? What do I do? What do I do? And I'm just asking myself this question. And then I felt like I was on this walk with my mom and I I felt like I heard this voice come to me and say, I want to be cremated. And I was like, oh, Grant, is that you? You know, like, and I was like, of course you do because your body looks horrible (laughs) and you don't want people to see that. (laughs) Because I was like- the crash. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he, you know, like he he did have that body image and I, I was so deep into that connection with how he would feel about how he looked that I knew he would not like an open casket. And at the same time, I was struggling with that because I was like, people, like, I think it's part of the whole process. Like if you see them, you get the closure, you know? So like- do I take that away from everybody? I'm not sure. And if I cremate, you know, like I know the church has said you shouldn't do that. And I think that was kind of rescinded. And, and then this is where like a theological question comes up. Like if an all powerful God can't like put together the ashes of someone, it's all chemical element anyway. And if a God can't like play with the elements to make whatever he wants, like that, that makes no sense to me that God can't resurrect a cremated body because I'd heard that many times, you know, mm-hmm. and I was just like, well, if that's true, then that's ridiculous. So, you know, I was like, I don't have a problem with cremating. Some of, you know, I got a little bit of pushback, like, but nobody was really like, oh, you shouldn't do that because of the state that I was in. And so I didn't get, I, I didn't get a lot of like any input on any of the decisions I had to make. And I think that was just like people just we're afraid to say anything. Like, I don't want to say the wrong thing. And so I felt like super isolated and alone making these really intense decisions. And I didn't really have an opinion on a lot of them. Like, so I was like, well, I don't want to buy a casket and bury it. That seems like a waste of money. So they're like, oh, well you can rent caskets. I'm like, really? Okay. I'll just rent one. And I decided to do an open casket and, you know, And they're like, you have to make this decision right away because, you know, if you don't make it within the next few hours, we're not going to be able to get all these like formulas inside, you know. And I was just like, oh, this is so weird. Like, can't we just like love him and then bury him? Like, why does it have to be so complicated? (laughs) But um, anyway, I was like, well, I guess I'll just go along with the process because that's how it's done. And I don't know another way. And uh, yeah, okay, go ahead and do the things. And so we ended up... I. I did it. I was like, you know, I don't really want to focus on life. I want to, or on death. I want to focus on life. So I planned a celebration of life in St. George and one in Salt Lake, and then just an open casket right before the funeral so that, you know, anybody that wanted to be there could, but it wasn't going to be like this big funeral thing. And so we drove him back to Salt Lake and, you know, planned and prepared for everything on the way home. This was another thing that was just like really special to me. Um, it was like the middle of July and in Utah, it's really hot in July. And 
I'm driving home and it's just raining and th- this thunderstorm is like incredible. It's just like thunder all over the place, lightning all over the place. And I was just like, and, and all these tears. And by this time I was feeling really like the sadness of it. And I, I just felt like, you know, the heavens are weeping for me. Like this is, this is my storm. Like this is, this is the heavens like expressing like, we feel you, we see you, we hear you, you know, and we're with you. And the lightning, I mean, Grant was always playing with fire. I'm like, ah, he's up there, like playing with the lightning bolts and, you know, exploring all his new uh, talents that he's got with, you know, all of his new non-limitations now that he's out of his body and he's just having so much fun out there, uh, you know, and like telling myself all these stories, you know, but at the same time, it was, it, it was really meaningful because it connected with, you know, his life and how I felt like the heavens were responding to where I was at. And, you know, it it rarely rains in July in Utah. So it was like, this is, and it rained every day that I was there. And then I went back to St. George and it stopped. And Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, maybe I'm just seeing this. I don't know if this is reality, (laughs) but it felt very customized to where I was at. And I, I really felt, you know, loved and, and seen and understood just from what was happening outside of me. Did you announce it on the YouTube channel? Did mm-hmm. you let everyone know? Yeah, and did the a day. bunch of fans want to come to the funeral? That yeah, kind of thing? yeah. So we announced it on the yeah. on the YouTube channel. Um, it was just obviously like really somber. It's still on there, you know, like if you Google Grant Thompson death, you know, that's usually the first video that uh, pops up that our hosts at the time just made that announcement. I did say, you know, I was like, I, so many people love him. I want to give them the opportunity to come and see this. And, you know, this potentially could be another good opportunity to share about, you know, how we view life after death and what's going to happen and like share the gospel because, you know, this isn't the end. And, you know, this is like an opportunity for the whole world to kind of experience what happens through the process of death when, you know, you're sealed in the temple and you're going to be together forever. And you have these beliefs around, you know, this isn't the end, even though this is definitely the end. (laughs) So, um, I'm just noticing that I, I I was just looking up, um, him on Google and this is like the New York times covered this story, NBC news, USA today, the BBC, Mm -hmm. this is a global news story. TMZ, the sun, which is in the UK. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, okay, so I, and I, I, I apologize. I had never seen your YouTube channel before this morning, really. Yeah. And I, I, I don't think I'd heard of this cause I, I guess I'm not plugged in to that scene. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's okay. I mean, we always used to make this joke between us. Like we don't watch YouTube. We make YouTube, So <laughs> yeah. you know, we don't have time to watch it cause we make it. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but yeah, I mean the, the reach that it had, I mean, this was a world throughout the whole world, everybody, you know, I mean, we had fans in every part of the world. And so when this happened, it was just like, what? Uh, You know, it felt like everybody kind of lost this icon that was part of the YouTube creation. Is he kind of a celebrity? Mm Because I mean, Access Hollywood, like Mm -hmm. that's... Uh, Yeah, I know. It's crazy. Yeah, because I'd never never heard of them. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this was our whole... Are you a celebrity too? Or are you? I mean, I was kind of like the wife of Grant Thompson, you know? Did you guys do red carpet stuff? Yeah, we did some of that. We went to some events and, you know, it depended on if we could make it or not. And I mean, it wasn't a lot of that, but we did do some really fun things. And, you know, we have the the photographs and all that of the red carpet and... Hmm. I mean, it it was still relatively a new world. Every time we went to like an event, it was like the first one they'd ever done. So we just like, it was just what we were doing. And we didn't put it into context of like, we're famous YouTubers until the end, you know? And then it was like, oh yeah, we're famous YouTubers. That's like what we do. (laughs) Mm. But, but until then it was, it was our life and our family. And, you know, we were just making videos in our basement. That's the reality of it. Like, so did we feel like celebrities? Not really. When we went out and got recognized, it was like, oh, yeah, this is a little bigger than we thought. Hmm. And, you know, even that's kind of an adjustment to figure out like, oh, how do I interact with this? Like people coming up at the store and like, are you Grant Thompson? Are you guys the king of random? Did you do this project? And it's like, yeah, we did. And they're like, oh, my gosh, you're like, you know, I've done this project and I've done this project and I've watched you from here. And, you know, now I'm going to college and I'm getting my engineering degree because it's, it's really amazing. It's really amazing to see the impact of how when you share your gifts, how they affect other people's lives. And so there's that beautiful aspect of it. You know, when you're giving your life for something, 
how it really changes other people's lives. And that was part of our mission. I'm curious, um, you know, how you experienced the balancing of feeling a deep personal loss Mm -hmm. and specifically too with your children, you know, losing a dad Mm -hmm. and having to balance Mm -hmm. the public loss Mm -hmm. though and how they felt about that. Yeah, that's such a good question. And if I'm being totally honest, I don't know that I've processed my personal loss with it because I have, I've been in everyone else's experience with the loss. And that's not to say I haven't felt the loss. I have. I mean, when I'm, you know, laying in bed by myself every single night, I feel the loss, but I don't feel like I've allowed it to like really touch me and impact me because I'm taking care of my kids. I'm taking care of, you know, like the business I'm dealing with, you know, the logistics of that. I'm talking to the employees, I'm helping with the channel, I'm doing all these different things. And again, I'm just like continually going outside of myself to make sure everybody else is okay around, you know, what happened here. And that's not to say I'm neglecting myself because I'm not, um, you know, I do feel a deep sense of, um, kind of like crippling inability to engage in life at times. And it's not because I'm not capable. It's just because I'm like so overwhelmed with everything that's happened that, you know, in that first year, I, I would try to commit to things, but then that day would, you know, I'd wake up and I'm like, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to get out of bed today. And there's really nothing I can do about it. And I just have to wait until I feel like I can, but it's like the moment I can, I'll do again. And so, but, so, but even in those experiences where I'm like, okay, I'll honor how I feel. I'll stay in bed. I'll do all these things. I'm not feeling the loss, I'm feeling how do I get through this to the next thing so I can keep going, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So survival. Yeah. Is kind of what I'm hearing. Yeah. By staying super busy. Yeah. And that that's also a defense mechanism that I Mm -hmm. used because it it feels good. I mean, I've done a lot of things since he died. I, you know, I've moved my family twice. I've bought a house. I renovated the whole thing. I've, you know, restructured the entire business. I've written a book. I've, you know, I've run a blog. Like uh, so the book that I'm writing is not about this oh. yet. That's coming. This is just a book I'm kind of, I love to write. So I have a blog where I kind of go through a lot of the things that- Is I, it a public blog? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's it called? It's called followtheenergyoftheday.com. Okay. So I've been doing that for two years and and I've really just been like focusing on finding myself, healing myself and like being really in touch with- reality and accepting reality and then trying to make the most beautiful situation out of every reality, no matter how undesirable reality is, because that's kind of the process. So in the loss, I guess I have found so many things that again, I don't feel like I've suffered from a loss within the loss I'm suffering, if, if that makes sense. Mm. Mm. Because I, I keep looking for things to f- to fill the space where the loss would be. And so, you know, again, like just being s- totally honest, like I don't think that I've been, I've had the courage yet to allow myself to feel that loss. And I've been able to keep myself so busy through the whole process that, you know, it's been, it's been there that I can do that. Mm. So, mm. yeah, it, it, I mean, it's interesting how we approach grief as humans because it's like in in some aspects, I still don't feel like I want to accept that he's gone and like that's not going to change. So I'm like, it's almost like I'm getting everything ready for, you know, when he comes back, which logically I know that's never going to happen. I understand, you know, all of the logistics of how this happens. But at the same time, it's like in the back of your mind, I'm wanting to say, how can I fix this still? So I choose other things to fix. And, and, you know, this year has been interesting because I think I've gotten closer than I ever have to just really feeling that loss and allowing myself to feel that, but I just do it in little steps because it's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's too much to, you know, just say, okay, I'm ready. Yeah. 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 So I'm just checking out your blog and looks like you've done a little YouTube video and Mm -hmm. anyway, well, that's, that's really powerful. Um, and that's really hard what you've been through people. I don't think anybody can imagine what that's like unless they go through it. Yeah. Yeah. You can't. And it's one of those things where it's like, you know, if you lose a spouse and a child, those are, those are experiences that are so much more 
impactful in your everyday life than it is when, you know, your mom dies, you love your mom, yeah. but yeah. it doesn't affect your she everyday your life. life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you lose a spouse and it's like every aspect of your life is different. Yeah every minute of the day, you lose a child and it's like yeah. similar to that, you know? And so those two losses where, you know, they're way younger than you think they should be. And they're a part of your everyday life. It's like, those are just, just different losses that people, not many people experience and not many people can comprehend. I mean, it does happen, but that's not the normal experience, you know? Other than your miscarriage, you didn't lose a child, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Do you want to share what your kid's reaction was when you told them? We never... Yeah. So my oldest boy, he had stayed up that night and he, this, I mean, this was like, this just broke my heart. The night we were waiting, he got on his one wheel and he just drove to the park and he didn't tell me where he was going. And I was like, I, I just see him like going off. I'm like, where's my child going? It's like midnight and he's just like taking off. So I get in the car and I go try to find him and he's at the park. He went straight to where his dad was parked and he's just sitting there on the table. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm waiting for dad to come home. I'm like, son, first of all, we're missing somebody. You leave. And now I don't know where you are. So now that's two people that are missing. Like, this is not helpful. And you can't just wait here on the park bench. Like you have to be in a safe place. But he just, I mean, he wanted to make sure his dad got home, you know? And I just was like, in my mind, even at that moment, I was like, yeah, you're going to be waiting here forever. So we got to go home. You know, I didn't say that to him, but I was like, we need to wait in a safe place and let's try and get some sleep. So I brought him back home and he didn't want to come. And I think he had a hard time falling asleep that night and he finally did. And then in the morning, he, he's my oldest. And he, the first thing he said is, did they find dad? And, and this is where it's like, gosh, I wish there was a handbook to like, tell you how you tell your child that they're parent is dead, but there's not a handbook for that. And so it's like, he was like, is he dead? And I was like, yeah. Cause that's what he asked. He's like, did they find dad? I was like, yeah. And then he said, is he dead? And I was like, yeah. And he just kind of looked at me like it's silence, you know? And he, I don't know that he was even like comprehending it. Cause it was just such a brash conversation of the truth. But how do you process that when it's that is the conversation? And, you know, and I think then I, you know, started to explain, yeah, he was paragliding and he crashed and um, he didn't, you know, survive the crash. And, you know, my son's like contemplating it. And then, and then what he said was just really another just interesting thing. Like, he's like, can I have his Go GoPro? <laughs> I was like, what? You know, like, let's not get on to the things like this is your dad. Like, I just, I was like, I don't know, you know? And then, and then it's like, as soon as I said, yes, like he's dead, I just saw this like slump happen in his little body, you know? And then he asked the, you know, the question about the camera. And then he just went into the other room and we have swings all over our house. And I like to leave the swings up and he just like, he just started swinging, you know? And I was like, okay. You know? And then the other kids slowly woke up and I didn't tell them. And, and I, and I said to him, I was like, I don't want to tell the other kids until we're ready. And so then my mom got there and we took them all into my room and I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to tell them now. And my mom's here. So I, I guess this is how you do it. And so I just told the kids, you know, like dad was in an accident last night and he died. So he's not coming home. And my five-year-old at the time just kind of looked at me like, what? And my nine-year-old at the time or eight, he was eight. And he just looked at me and just got up and ran out of the room and started crying. And I was like, that's an interesting response because he's my less emotional kid usually. And then my baby, he's two and he's like, no, daddy's not, not coming home. <laughs> you know? And he just said like, he's like, no, that's not okay for you to say dad's not coming home. And it was just so cute and sweet. And, you know, and then I was like, uh, you know, if I could go back and do it, what I would do is I would take each one of them individually. I'd sit down with them. I'd hug them. I'd hold them. And I'd say, I have something really hard to tell you. And this is going to change your whole life. And you're not going to want to hear it. And I wish I didn't have to tell you, you know, like kind of prep them. And I wish I could have done it individually. So, you know, that's something that if I could go back and do it better, that's what I would do. So, you know, maybe that will help someone at some point to do something like that a little bit better. But, you know, I, I, I did it the way I did it. And it, it everything about it was just hard. Yeah. Yeah. 
And they all had completely different reactions. Yeah. As we're kind of wrapping up this episode, is there anything you want to say about the Mormon funeral or the way the church or its members reacted in positive ways and maybe in not so positive ways? And I saw a blog post about how to support someone when they're grieving. So Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to, if you want to incorporate any of those ideas into this kind of final thing to talk about. Yeah. So, you know, um, I just recently about a year ago had a a girlfriend who was a college roommate lose her husband. They have five kids and it's like, uh, I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm reliving this through you. Like I just went through this two years ago, you know? Yeah. And she's going through this now. And as I watched her kind of interact with the funeral and like everything that was happening, there's this space. And, and I've heard many people who have had like incredible losses like this, talk about the same thing that happens. It's like you, you're in this phase of like shock and a lot of, you know, what I would call grace. It's like your mind's not really functioning, but you can interact with the world, but you're not there, but you can still get things done. It's very interesting. And so like mm. during that like time, kind of? yeah, like a disassociation. Mm. And during that time, I think that there is a lot of space for people to be really supportive. And I, 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 I felt like during that time, people were kind of distanced and were like, I don't know what to do. And, you know, but I, I feel like, one of the things that was really great is I, I had a whole group of friends and family come up and just stay at my house, you know, and just being there felt so good and so safe for me. And I didn't have to talk to him. I didn't have to do anything, but just being there. And that's an impactful time because you are disassociated, but if you're left alone, it's really scary. But if you have someone there and it doesn't matter what you say, because the person's probably not even going to remember it, (laughs) you know, but just like showing up as a supportive space, like there's a lot of impact to be had during that time. So don't be afraid to interact with the people like right after it happens. Like one of my friends was like, oh, I wanted to give you space. I was like, I, I felt abandoned, you know, like I didn't want space. I wanted people around me. And, and probably everybody's a little bit different on that. But one of the biggest things I would say is don't be afraid to do what you're feeling like you want to do. If you feel like you want to call them, call them. That doesn't mean I'm going to answer, you know, or if you want to come over and bring cupcakes that doesn't mean I'm going to eat them. But if you come over, like I might feel great or I might not want to see, it doesn't matter. Just do what you feel like you can do and want to do. And that's what's impactful and meaningful. Mm. Yeah. I think the Jewish people have a a ritual called sitting Shiva where like everybody Mm -hmm. shows up at the house. Yeah. It's like a whole weekend, I think. Yeah. We're just, you just go. Yeah. And you just hang around. Yeah. And if you're not actually talking to the person who's grieving, mm-hmm. you're talking to community members or yeah. siblings or children or and yeah. just it's just like community showing up mm-hmm. to be a presence around mm-hmm. the time of the death. Yeah. And I think where I was coming from, it's like, well, we should all be doing something. And I, you know, I wish I could have felt like that was okay because that's exactly what I needed. And I couldn't be really present in it because I was like, well, I have to entertain everybody. And you know, everyone's like, no, you don't have to entertain us. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and just, you know, like the culture around death, it's like, mm-hmm. rather than it being taboo and we don't know what to say, what if we could just let it be what it is and sit in it and be okay saying the wrong thing because it actually might be the right thing. But if you're afraid to say it because it's the wrong thing and you don't know, and then you don't say it, then you, we, I, I see us constantly missing out on these opportunities to connect out of fear mm. or uncertainty. Yeah. Okay. So, and then as far as the funeral, you know, it just, I, I wanted, so one of the things that I referenced, so I spoke at his funeral And I just felt like no one can honor him the way I could because I know him, like every detail about him. And so I really wanted to be the one to speak. I had another speaker that was really great. And, you know, we did some songs and my objective around the funeral. And and this was because I wanted to uh, really show the life he lived, the intention, the energy that he lived with. Um, Like I wanted people to come to the funeral and feel like they were uh, edified, uplifted, motivated to live a better life and inspired. And so that was my objective with what I spoke about 
in the funeral. And, and then one of the things that I talked about, he just loved paying tithing, you know, and in the doctrine and covenants, there's this scripture that talks about it. It's like, it'll save you from being burned at the last day or whatever, you know, and, you know, we kind of joke that it's fire insurance. And so, you know, I, like, I, I kind of leaned over and I was like, I sure hope that's paying off for you now, you know, and like tried to make it like kind of this like <laughs> light, dark. I know, isn't it <laughs> but, like this lighthearted thing, but like, he was so committed to paying tithing. He just loved it so much that I'm like, you know, I hope that's true for you, <laughs> you know, because now that's when it's going to be tested. But, but at that point I was like, you know, this isn't a separation. This is just goodbye for right now. We're going to see each other again. Um, this is a graduation. It's not a death. It's just a transition. I mean, this is kind of where I was coming from in all the things that I was saying at the funeral, because this is what I had been conditioned to believe. And this is how death you know, every time I was at a funeral, these are the things that you say and, you know, families are together forever. And so, you know, like this is just, it's, it's fine. Like you're going to see him again and everything's fine. Like that's kind of really like the nonchalant approach that was like, oh, well, you know, it's okay. Cause you'll see him again. And I guess on a level that provides a lot of just support. It's just like, Hey, it's really isn't a tragedy. Like it's an inconvenience. But we're going to just pick up right where we left off when I die and everything's yeah. going to be great. Yeah. And I think in the moment, like right after it happens, because mm. life hasn't really been altered, those were comforting words. Yeah. It, it's not until like six months later and it's like, oh, you're going to see him again. And I'm like, well, I haven't seen him for six months. And like life has gotten really hard since then. Mm, so yeah. that's don't that's not comforting. Yeah. Do not tell me that again, because I actually don't want to see him again. Yeah. You know, and that's when that shift comes. But in those first moments, it's like... Oh yeah, it's okay. Like, uh, you know, I'll see him again. It'll it'll feel like the blink of an eye. Uh, Fifty years will go by, and I'll look back, and they'll be like, "Oh, it was nothing." You know, like these are the kinds of things that I was saying and feeling and believing. And you know, even if it's you know, a couple years or fifty years, it will all feel the same. I'm sure. You know, <laughs> I think it's hard too because kind of right after, right after someone dies, oftentimes. You know, there are there are sort of stages to grief and they're not uh, organized linear. in any way or yeah, they're not linear. Um, so it's it's interesting, right? Because mm -hmm. when you have a loss like that, it really depends on where you are mm -hmm. in that moment. And I think oftentimes when we attend memorial services or we attend funerals, um, you know, for the family members, the really close family members, most of the time they happen so close to the death mm -hmm. and all those decisions that need to be made, you, you haven't even really started. For, mo for the most part, we're still in shock, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, when we're attending funerals and witnessing people give talks or it's oftentimes the, the days after mm -hmm. where it kind of really settles and then the grief or loss process begins to really kind of take root. I just think it's interesting because I think the way we show up as a culture is like a, a flash photo. Um, yeah. It's very much like a memorial service. And that's kind of our concept of death. It's like a moment or a meeting of two hours um, when really mm -hmm. it's this whole process where you feel just right as such mm -hmm. a myriad of feelings and emotions. And it looks so different from person to person. Yeah. And so holding it all with like a lot of gentleness and softness um, for people and realizing that there's a lot missing um, when it goes to like what's going on on the inside or what's to come mm -hmm. if we're only looking at a memorial service for people. Yeah. Yeah. And during that whole first month, I just felt like I'm not even on the ground. I felt like I was just as angelic as my husband was, you know, like I just felt like I was being held in the hand of God. And that's the only way I was mm. able to get through this. And I even remember, you know, like a month after two weeks and like he, he, it felt really close. And then after three weeks, it, it started, I started to feel this dissonance a little bit. And then four weeks, it was like, it was almost as if I was feeling this hand starting to set me down, like, okay, little one, it's time for you to walk on your own. And I was like, no, 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 do not set me down. Like, let me just stay in here forever. But it's like, no, this is the process of grace. Like, I'm going to hold you for a little while and then I'm going to put you down and you got to walk on your own. And I'm like, nope, don't want to walk on my own. Don't do that to me. Like, I will not function because now I'm starting to see what this life is really going to be like. It's been long enough that I'm starting to actually see that. And this is going to be way too difficult. But 
also having that feeling of like God's holding me right now and that is how I feel and that's what I believe and mm. and it was very comforting and beautiful and wonderful and it's the reality of what I was experiencing like how I interpreted what I was experiencing and it felt that way and mm. I mean even now when I think back on that it's it's this very peaceful heavenly feeling of just things are as they are you're going to be okay and you don't have to think about any of that. You're just being held. And it, it's it's a really, it's one of those feelings I wish that I could explain in words and I can't. And I wish everybody could feel it. And, you know, maybe people have felt this, but the closest thing I would describe to it is, you know, on each day when my babies were born, that first day that they were born, it's just like, there's this magic in the air and it's so happy because you've got this brand new little baby and it's like, they're just sent from heaven, you know? And it, this is like the, the, the opposite end of that. It's like, there's another transition into or out of life. Right. And there's the same feeling that's around it. And so that was that was another interesting aspect of like how I'm feeling around this, you know, transition. And it reminded me a lot of a birth too, which, you know, helped me connect life process here. Like this is all part of it. I love that. That's yeah. really beautiful. It reminds me also of you kind of talking earlier about um, not, you know, oftentimes when we think about uh, the loss of someone, it's like, someone being taken mm -hmm. or something being taken or realities being taken or love being taken or whatever, mm -hmm. um, the presence, the physical presence of someone, you know, yeah. but also that something can be given mm -hmm. too, that things can be, you know, you can lose, but you're also given. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and this is where the concept of, you know, every new beginning comes from some other beginnings end. it's a song like really... Uh, mm -hmm. famous song. But anyway, like that just gave me a whole new perspective on that because, you know, I think of a new beginning as the birth of a baby, but that's also the end of your life without a child, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. And, you know, the death of my husband is a, is a new life without him, you know, or it's a new life in myself. I mean, there's just so many, so many ways to look at it when you're willing to, again, like ask yourself those hard questions. And it's like, well, it doesn't mean I am glad he died. It doesn't mean I wanted him to die, but you know, I've got to ask myself another question. So what now, what is my life going to be like? And how can I make it actually better than when he was here? Like, and is that okay? And I hope it is because that's what I want. <laughs> and I don't want to feel guilty about wanting that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that is the perfect way to end part one of your story, which we had envisioned as only being a one-parter, but it's too good. And now we got to figure out how to do the second part. But um, Janae Thompson, this has been really powerful. Thank you. And we still have the meat. I think the meat yeah, of what you wanted to talk about. Really fun things. You didn't come to me wanting to talk about your husband's death mm -mm. and grief. Mm -mm. You wanted to talk about like what happens after and being a, a widow mm -hmm. woman, you know, in, in Mormonism, dating, dealing yeah. with the aftermath. Yeah. Cause after that, life. that whole transition, like this, I mean, this thing happened, but then it's the life after that. And it's like, Oh, the life I had before does not work at all anymore. Mm -hmm. And so then it's like, okay, what else is not working? Yeah. yeah. There's yeah. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's going to be part two. So, so thank you, uh, mm -hmm. Janae Thompson, for part one. Uh, this has been really powerful. Thank you. I know it's going to help a lot of people. And Margie, it's mm -hmm. always so lovely to have you mm -hmm. riding shotgun. So mm -hmm. glad I'm here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So please don't go away. Uh, come right back for part two of our interview with Janae, where we're going to talk about, you know, rebuilding your life as a Mormon widow. Is that the way to how describe it? How do you identify? It? How do you, how um, would you talk about yourself? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Like, this was another funny question. My kids after asked me, like, uh, just a couple of days after dad died, you know, they're like, mom, are you a widow now? And I was like, uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, I mean, yeah, that's the term for this situation. Like, do I consider myself a widow? No, I don't define myself that way. I'm a, I'm a mother, you know, I'm, I'm a woman, I'm living my life. I'm expressing my dreams. Like that's kind of how I relate to myself. And that's just one of the many titles that can describe a certain aspect of who I am. Yeah. 
maybe like rebuilding your life after your husband dies, mm -hmm. you know, something like yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. Well, can't wait. Thank you so much. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, if you want to use the word widow, I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. Like, oh, however, yeah. 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 I think actually that would probably be more powerful for a title. So for that aspect, yes, you can say widow. What do you know about YouTube titles? Yes, I do. That's why I was <laughs> like, that's a much that's better a title out. word, just so you know. <laughs> Anything you want to plug before we end this episode other than your amazing channel, which you don't need my plugs, but uh, um, TKOR. Well, you know, just like if people want to hear more about like the whole grief process and what I've been through. My blog is a really good resource for that. That's follow the energy of the day.com. We'll mm -hmm. have a link to it in the show notes. Yes. And that was one of the things Grant would say just every day when we were just trying to live our, you know, best life is I'm just going to follow the energy of the day and see where it takes me, you know? And I was like, that's a really great mantra. I'm happy you can do that, but I've got too much to do right now. And then, you know, like I've, I've had a shift in my perspective on that. And so it's, it's a really meaningful concept to me. Beautiful. All right. Thanks, Janae. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Margie. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Join us. Come right back for part two with Janae. Thanks, everybody. Mm-hmm.